This is Off Planet Radio. Hi guys, welcome back to Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. I'm here with my favorite person, Randy Moggins, and two other friends of ours, and uh, we're going to get right down to it tonight. This should be a really interesting show. So, uh, time and money. Uh, these are the two things that really control us and keep us stuck in whatever the fuck this is that we are in. It is mostly because we misunderstand them. Cliff High is back with us tonight. In part one of our series on time, we began the process of unpacking that mystery. And uh, since that is my preferred topic, <laughs> the plan is to get back to that tonight. However, since we are in this reality, it seems we must deal with money before we can get to time. So this first segment came about when after seeing our first show on time, a good friend and prior guest on the show called me to tell me she loved it and that she had started watching some of Cliff's other videos to try and get a better understanding of Bitcoin. She said she was beginning to think <laughs> nobody actually understood it, which was funny because I had had that thought myself. I said, I'm going to ask Cliff if we can do a segment on Bitcoin where you can ask him your questions, and Cliff kindly obliged. And here we are. So hopefully this discussion can help to clarify both the workings and the larger moral and societal implications for humanity in regards to cryptocurrency. So to do this, we welcome back independent journalist, artist, and quantum language hacker Danny Katz. Danny Katz, well, meet Cliff High, Cliff High, Danny Katz, and here we go. <laughs> All right. Welcome back. Can you, can you guys hear? Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody's saying. All right. So, welcome back to both of you. Um, Thank you. Let's, 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 uh, let's get to it. Danny. Yeah. Hi, I'm Randy Moggins. I used to be the host <laughs> of this show a long time ago. You might remember me. <laughs> oh. He used to be I, material. No, that actually was a very good intro. Thank you. And I said you were my favorite person before I said I know you else. did. <laughs> <Yeah>. So <laughs> anyway, all right. So kids, let's um Daniel um, Cliff, let's let's get to it. Yeah. Um Cliff, I'll just start off the meat of the matter. What is the value that's being exchanged with Bitcoin or or crypto in general? Sure. Uh that gets right back to money and time. Okay. If we think about um uh, money in the past, it's been things, material items, objects. We say that gold has an intrinsic value, but that's not really true. It has an intrinsic cost. It takes a certain amount of money or a certain amount of energy to actually dig the stuff up, refine it, make it into jewelry. And then you give it to a woman. If you're lucky, she likes it. She likes you. So it had value at that point in that emotional exchange. And, and so all money basically comes down to the idea of, a, of an emotional attachment to something. And in the past, it's been some items. Um, and we noticed that gold, silver, uh, metals, and in places like uh, Yap, the big stone wheels, all of these things were really good at holding value. Once they were dug up and refined, they held the value, but they're hard to really get into the exchange part, right? Uh, you know, gold was, was interesting because you can, it's very malleable. You can put it between two sheets of leather and pound it with a hammer and pound out a, um, I think that you have to check the statistics, but I think the uh, gram of the stuff will pound out to almost uh, a three foot by three foot a square yard. Uh, and so you can make thin jewelry out of it. Women liked it. So it had some, some use to you there. But over time, it, uh, or, or one of the things we notice is that it's difficult to do a transaction. It's difficult to move these things relative to our emotional attachment to them. And so money at that level, it was an anchor. It was slowing us down. So the Chinese invented paper, and they said these slips of paper represent that gold that we've got lying on the ground over there in this big building. And that the paper is easier to move. You can just get this stuff from one side of the kingdom to the other with no worries. You know, you can hide it in your underneath your armpit and get past the bandits. Uh, if you're lugging the gold itself, it's a big carriage, it's a big to-do, you gotta have all kinds of guards, it's expensive, etc. So over time, what we discovered was money had a time value. 
that it was that you needed, for instance, if you were an empire, to go and pay the guys way the hell out on the fringe. And so you couldn't take nine months to get them last month's pay. You had to do it in a fairly judicious fashion. So there's all these schemes that were set up to, to control things with money all around the idea of time. What's happened recently is we've, we've gotten really smart and we've made time money. So this is something that people don't really grasp about Bitcoin, and I'll show you that the, in all cryptos, the transaction is the same as beating a piece of gold out and handing it to a, to a woman uh, as a gift and getting the emotional transaction there. Uh, my dogs are going to go crazy over the UPS guy. <laughs> we'll, we'll let that occur. Anyway, though, um, so uh, now what we've done is we've decided that we need something really fast to go and do this stuff globally. Mailing now with globalism uh, in any form whatsoever, mailing money back and forth, physically carrying atoms around the, the planet makes no sense at all. And trying to carry something that is precious in and of itself, such as gold or silver, just makes it a target for all the bandits that are out there. Plus, it increases your cost, yada, yada, yada. So what we've done is we've decided that let's, let's make encryption the ability to encrypt something in a way that it can't be unencrypted and tie it to time, and we'll call that money. And so that's really what's going on with the, the computers that are mining for Bitcoin or any of these other cryptocurrencies. They're dealing, they're racing against time. They're racing to put their stamp on a, on a ledger. And the ledger just has my name all hashed out and encrypted within an amount all hashed out and encrypted that I'm sending to you. And these guys are racing against time to be able to say that I put your connection to my connection. I validated your hash is accurate. I validated his hash is accurate. I validated that the transaction is accurate. And I was able to timestamp it, put it in with all these other ones and put it back out on the, on the internet. Hooray, I win the, uh, the, the algorithmically generated Bitcoin. So it sort of makes a little sense, right? It's what we're actually doing is racing against time and tying it to a timestamp. It doesn't and, make sense to me. Okay. Um, so as I understand, actually, salt was the first money, which has value because we used it in like cooking and healing. And gold had value not as an adornment, but because it was monatomic and it was a superconductor and it was free energy and it was all these other things. And that was where gold came in. But... I'm not understanding. So it's sounding like crypto is a fiat. It's like an agreement sure. of representation of something that has value. So like when we were on the gold standard back in the day, but what is the value in racing to prove that something happened? Like what's the... Okay, the value is that it, it defeats what's known as the double spend issue. Okay. The thing about electronic currencies is write once or create it once and you can copy it millions of times very easily. We all know how easy it is to copy a file. And so, so digital anything for money makes no sense at all. And then that's when you get into an issue because if I were to create a Bitcoin, then I could copy it and infinitely create Bitcoins, just keep creating them as much as I might need. But then no one would agree they had any value. The only reason that our Bitcoins have any value at all is that when we put it into the ledger, everybody in the network has a consensus and they all agree what the state of that ledger is. So this is exactly what money is for. It's for consensus, it's for agreement, it's for transactions. And now we're putting our emotional transactions into a digital form, so to speak, and being able to transmit it uh, nearly instantaneously. Eh. You know, it can take a while on some of the Ethereum networks if there's a big ICO or something, but nearly instantaneously around the planet to exchange value, just as we're doing with our attention, just as we're doing with the videos, just as we're doing with our energy now. So we are energy beings. What we're finally doing is taking the energy from our, our um, a corporeal part of us and matching it to a digital form that we're going to call money. And we're emotionalizing it as money and also as currency at the same time. The two are not necessarily synonymous. Okay, salt doesn't make a good money because anybody can create it. It doesn't hold its value. It only holds its value if it's rare, and then you must use it for, in order to gain it any kind of value out of it. So it's one of these self-depreciating kind of things. So, you know, in the, United, or in the, uh, the country that is the, the continent of the Americas, the first money was wampum. 
and, and it originated from these clamshells that only existed off the coast of British Columbia, off of Vancouver Island up here. Yet it spread across 60 million people, and all those 60 million people from coast to coast and from far north Canada to far into Mexico all agreed this stuff was money. It, was, it had value. And it, all it is is an agreement between people in a transaction that ultimately at its root is always emotional. I transact with you because of X, Y, Z. I'm going to buy something from you. I need to give you value. And so we're going to agree that I'm going to give you something that you can exchange for value locally. And that's right. really what's going on. Okay. So two questions, Cliff, and thank you for your patience with me on this. Sure. No worries. But with wampum, they were collecting shells. So there was an energetic output in like going out to the shore and looking for them and collecting them. So Question number one is I still don't understand what's backing. I understand it's recording transactions, it's recording them quickly, but I don't understand what's being exchanged. Sure. And then my second question is just as far as fiat and, and you saying that currency is based in, on an emotional exchange and trust, where we've created a fiat currency where it seems like with keeping record of all the transaction, isn't that based in mistrust? Because if we trust- Correct, them, correct. You're, you've hit the nail on the head, okay? The value in cryptocurrencies is it's a, it's a trustless system. I don't have to trust a central bank. I don't have to trust my bank to keep accurate records. If, if Once it's onto the blockchain, it's replicated in every single node, and it's there forever. And so it's always there, where's these the transactions. Where's the value in, in having in those that? transactions recorded forever? Because it sure. seems like... <laughs> energy to collect. Sure, exactly. Well, see, that gets to your first question is where is, where is the energy exchange? The energy exchange has been taken off of our backs as physical labor, digging the gold or, or diving down there to get the shells, that kind of thing. And it's been put in, out of, taken in, put onto our, our mentition, our ability to think, and we're putting it into our machines and making the machines do the work. That's why it is a, a proof of work system in doing Bitcoin. The, what, in order is, to, what work is the machine doing? Is it just the, the recording of the transactions? Yeah, exactly. It's recording and keeping track of our ledger, our transactions between us. Where's the value? Like, I, okay, I here's, the, here's, the, here's the actual value. Okay, a Bitcoin is not a number in your, in your digital wallet that says you have one Bitcoin. You'll never have anything in there if you were to actually open up and look at the text that's inside a Bitcoin, what it actually says, absent all of the hashing and the, uh, the obfuscation of the actual characters. It says input number one and input number two and a bunch of codes that add those two together, even if one of them is a negative number. And so input number one is Cliff has a Bitcoin. Input number two is he's sending part of a Bitcoin to Danny. Okay, add those two together. What it does is it adds the, the part I'm sending to you to your account on the ledger and it deducts it from my account on the ledger. And all of these computers agree anywhere. So some of the values I can present just off the top of my head is the ability to take a shotgun, blow the crap out of my computer and all of my records, uh, go to Fiji, buy another computer, connect up to the internet, take the secret number out of my head and recreate my entire account. Literally, if I had them, if I had them, move millions of notional dollars across the border ephemerally as a series of numbers in my head that could not be confiscated. So there's one value. Another value is the fact that we can't trust the central banks. Right now, if I ask you how many federal pre-mined federal coins do you own? How many digitally created pre-mined federal coins do you own? You, you look at me and it's like, what? Well, I'm asking you how many digital digits of federal reserve note representations are in your bank account? because you're dealing with a fiat digital currency right this moment. How many people are actually still dealing in paper anymore? So that system has fallen away. So ever since they did direct deposit, we've been digital whether we like it or not. My big deal, my, my thing is, let's all understand it down to the point where we really grok this stuff and then let's dominate this because it's decentralized. We don't have to trust the bastards. That's its inherent uh, beauty on all these cryptos is you don't have to trust me that, that I said I sent it to you because every single one of the nodes along the way knows that I sent it to you and I can't spin the stuff I sent to you. Right, but I feel like we're skipping a step because there's all this... Okay. Sounds on point as far as the trade and like the proof of the trade, but I'm still not clear 
what's being traded. And as far as like it being decentralized, it seems like Bitcoin or Ethereum or all of these have money based on how many US dollars it represents. So where is the intrinsic value in and of itself? I understand. Sure. I, I, get your, I get the question, right. And so here's the thing. Where's the intrinsic value in the U.S. dollar? Allegedly gold. And we know like we're in no, weird... No, 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 no. Where is, where is the intrinsic value in the U.S. dollar? You can't oh. redeem your, your dollars for gold. And we always value gold in U.S. dollars. We value everything in U.S. dollars because we're within the U.S. That's right. just I one way it... to conceive of it, see. But I grant your point. And but so what's help... actually... I, sorry. I'm sorry. It just doesn't help me conceive of it because... We know that the U.S. monetary system is bullshit and is based on nothing. So I'm just wondering what the value is of crypto, not in comparison to a broken, corrupt system that's based on nothing, but in and of itself as an entity that's not a reaction to something else. Sure, you know sure, I'm sure. I, under, I understand. I, I grasp your question, okay? And we can't actually examine it that way. You can ask, what is the intrinsic value of the crypto? But you'd have to also ask, what's the intrinsic value of gold? Because if the system crashes, there's no more intrinsic value in gold than there is in crypto. You can't trade gold across the nation if our system crashes. You can't trade your gold someone in the next county for the same amount of money as you would someone across the nation because the value of the gold would be so disparate. So there would be no unifying standard if the system crashes. So rather, I think it's better to look at it this way. Our system is bullshit. It's ephemeral. It's based on a, on a small cadre of people deciding how much money they're going to keep printing forever to fool us into being wage slaves and dupes, okay? But that system is based on this idea of fiat currency. Even though it's digital, it's still fiat. A fiat that is generated by a central authority on this planet has never lasted as long as the U.S. dollar. All fiat usually craps out around 42 years. The Chinese set the standard being able to get theirs almost 60 years. Every so often they would go paper currency, then gold or silver in both, paper currency, then gold or silver or both through the, uh, the past 6,000 years. All nations have done this. And so fiat currency has a known lifespan. Ours is dying. It only has maybe a couple of pennies left, if that, of purchasing power in each U U.S. dollar. And in fact, every single Saudi prince that gets arrested over the next few weeks, every single uh, USA politician that gets arrested over the next few weeks digs our system deeper into its death because the only thing that keeps us going on this system is confidence in the confidence game that is the Federal Reserve note. So we're living in, a, in a, an ephemeral system that's based on criminality, and it's dying. So given that as an alternative, you're looking at two possible broad futures, two possible strokes you could paint across the world from our perspective as USA citizens. One is Mad Max world, where we're forced on a barter system, and that's what gold and silver is. I'm going to barter my silver with you for those four eggs, or I'm going to barter this gold for you for, with you for those bullets that kind of thing. That's a terrible, miserable, miserable future because vast quantities of people in the U.S. are going to die simply because without the system, they cannot survive because of the way that we're engineered at the moment. So we're stuck. We're, if the system craps out, you can kiss probably 90% of the U.S. population off in, in less than five or 10 years, one way or the other. Now, we have an opportunity. Our opportunity is to build a new system as the old one crumbles. This is what has happened sort of infrequently with empires. Uh, when the French Empire was crashing, the, the English Empire was rising. And it goes on and on and on like this through history. Mostly, it's not good for people that are not uh, able to flee based on having stolen a lot of wealth. Mostly, it's not good for people that have to remain and suffer through it. This time, it may be different because cryptos are totally decentralized. There is no central issuing authority. It's an agreement. It's a consensus. It's a, it's a network effect among millions of people out there saying, this over here is bullshit. Let's invent something else new. And let's see if this can work. In another way of thinking about this, we've had um, uh, politicos and lawyers and uh, emperors and strongmen trying to dominate and, and control society for the last six or 7,000 years by way of their ability to create money. Let's give software engineers a chance and see what we can do, because ours at least will be egalitarian. Okay, 
Thank you so much for that, Cliff. A couple of questions. As far as software engineers, like, I thought we don't know who's engineering. Like, isn't it sort of like AI contained and we got- It's open source. It's open source. Anybody can go read the code. Okay, so I, I get that. Um, well, let me bookmark the question that I have next. But as far as like, our current system is, is for sure being sustained on criminal activity and is dying, but it also seems like Bitcoin has built itself up on criminal activity as this sort of anonymous means. That's not true. That's not true. You hear people like, um, oh, this uh, idiot out there. I, I will, you know, shouldn't characterize him that way. I don't know for sure he's an idiot, but he's demonstrating some of that with his language where he says the first five years of Bitcoin was based on criminal activity. And that's bullshit. In the first uh, real transactions of Bitcoin. talking about Quinn Michael. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. But how do we know all the transactions are anonymous? No, they're not. You can see them on blockchain.info. You just can't see who is behind the transaction, but you can see the transaction. No, no, no. My point is this. I can prove it. I know that no criminal activity was going on with Bitcoin at all to speak of because the volume of, quote, money available in Bitcoin was terrible for years and years and years from 2009 all the way up to past 2012. And we know this. Why? Well, because one guy got two pizzas for 10,000 Bitcoin. So there were, and Bitcoin is mined at a known rate. Right now, there's only 16 million plus Bitcoin out there. So if we assign a certain value to the amount of Bitcoin, we know that no matter what, the, it could not launder even a fraction of the current drug money, even a small fraction. See, so in the first five years of Bitcoin, it could not be doing criminal activity to speak of because there was no value in this stuff where you had to exchange 10,000 of them for uh, two pizzas. I was buying alpaca socks where I was spending six Bitcoin for a pair of socks. So, and there weren't that many Bitcoin to spend. So it was not getting any value out of the criminal system. It's anonymous, pseudo anonymous. Okay. If you know what you're doing, you can track down some things, right? Because people end up betraying those things that keep it anonymous if they were to really work on it. But it, it's only pseudo anonymous. Anybody that's involved knows to go to blockchain.info and you can track your own transactions. There's etherscan.io and that you can track all your ether exchanges. So it's all trackable. It's just that we don't bother to point out that so-and-so's name attached to this hashtag. Okay, I hear that. I'm wondering if it's possible, and I, I like maybe I'm just dense with this, so thank you for your patience with me, but I understand from your perspective why crypto is better than the dollar and is a way to ease us out of this. Like, no fiat currency in the history of fiat currency has lasted. Like, we know the U.S. dollar is going to crash. So it sounds like you're pointing to crypto as a great transition. But what I'm wondering if it's possible for you to explain the value of crypto for me, not comparing it to a crumbling fiat, but in and of itself, given how, much, how many people are putting so much of their trust and their savings in this, where is the value in and of itself as a freestanding? The, the value exists in the idea and that's really what it is. If you want to look at it one way, you just said what its value was because you said so many people are putting their savings into it. Okay. Some people are mining and some people are putting energy into it and they're using their computers to mine and process all of our transactions. And then they get rewarded by the network if their processors are fast enough. And so, so is there's that one what level. Mining? Is that what mining means? The report? Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sorry. Yeah, yeah. Uh, when we say Bitcoin mining, all that means is it's really cool. Okay. It, it, I, I was almost going to write some software for it in 2009. Conceptually, it's really cool. I, I have a Bitcoin wallet, which is a little tiny piece of software that simply records transactions. I say I am agreeing to send to you X amount of Bitcoin. And as soon as I do that, say go, it drops it down onto the internet on the same wire that we're communicating across right now, right? The same HTML protocols. It's a different protocol. That's all. Instead of showing web pages, it just allows all of these transactions to be dropped out there. They're totally anonymous at that stage. And then these miners, all their software does is reach down and pick up what they, the transactions out of what they call the mempool, which is basically sucking them up off of the internet the way that you might suck up a web page into your browser. And so they collect a bunch of these and they put them into a block, which is like they just write them down real fast onto a, onto a page. But in order to do that, they make sure that you're you, I'm me, and that we each have the amount in the wallets that we're supposed to. And then they stamp it and they put it back out there as a completed block. 
So really, when we say mining, we're just talking about people that are really fierce accountants, okay? <laughs> they're not mining anything. They're not out there with pickaxes, you know, even, even uh, metaphorically. These guys are accountants, and they're just really fierce about it and being able to timestamp all of this because if they timestamp it faster than anybody else, every so often, every 10 minutes or so, new bitcoins will be created for the person for the for the miner that wins that particular race now there's one other intrinsic value okay that should not be discounted and that is the pseudo anonymous part of it can be 100% anonymous and it also that provides what we can say of is surety of of known contact or proof of good all right so here's the here's the idea even before Bitcoin was worth a dollar, even before it was worth a, a few cents, it had value to the people that were on the internet because they could be exchanged along with a, a defined signature that proved you were you. And so I could write an email, I could encrypt it, I could put it on the blockchain and send it with a Bitcoin. This is before Bitcoin had any, any monetary value whatsoever. And that email or whatever text or whatever I put in there was a, a a group consensus agreed it came from my wallet and that I personally said, go ahead and do it. So you, as the receiver of it, could be 100% sure that you were contacting me directly and reading what I had, had written down. So for like spies and people, that's really good. Everybody would say, okay, you know, get it through. It could be encrypted and so on. But it has the ability to have proof of identity. That's very difficult to achieve these days digitally. Okay, I get that. So it sounds like nothing's being exchanged, really, but Correct. a lot of being recorded. Okay, so there's nothing of intrinsic value. There's a lot being recorded. So I've heard a lot about how much energy is required, which is why people are renting out their computers for the mining. So given how, I mean, obviously, Bitcoin's more popular now than it ever was, but still in the grand scheme, not a lot of people know about it. Compared Correct. To Correct. Right. Why is it taking so much computer power just to record transactions? What is, do you know what I'm saying as far as the energetic output that's going into this recording? Okay, the, what's actually going on is it's not simply writing down the numbers, it's doing this thing called hashing, okay? And that's where we, where we use a complex algorithm and we distort those numbers uh, and seal them up in what's known as a hash. These hashes, where the current one that we're using is SHA-256, uh, invented by the NSA, where, they, where you want to encrypt stuff. And it's a way of encrypting it, so only was those things... Was it invented things... by the NSA 4? No, or... no, 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 no. It would... Uh, they just uh, they just keep inventing new hashes because people just keep trying to crack them and they've got secrets they want to protect. And so uh, it was just uh, taken at the time that Bitcoin was created as the standard from which we would begin. And it's harder to do each, each hash. So let me see if I can uh, put it to you this way. Uh, it's a secret word and um, it's made out of all of the letters of your name and there might be a dozen different secret words we could use that could arrive, uh, arise from your name that we could decode, but um, it'd take us a couple of seconds to do the first one or two, but then as we got into the really tricky ones, it takes us uh, a minute and a half or two minutes or three minutes to think about it and come up with the, the mixture of letters that still allows it to be decoded. So every time we do a hash, it becomes harder, becomes more difficult to do because uh, we're basically- what, what's to, to, to disguise to disguise everything to make it anonymous yet yet still workable so, so all of the energetic output is going towards amping up the anonymity of these exchanges of nothing correct <laughs> correct correct <The> <laughs> you hit it she's Basic, got it basically you're taught you you're saying that the ongoing process and the process that would be ongoing which i get the sense this is permanent overhead for this system is to stay ahead of the cryptography itself, which, as most people know, cryptography is this elusive search for the perfect cipher that hides everything inside of a little ball. And yet you can unreal it. You can get it back out of the ball. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Yes. But the question then becomes, in my mind, first off, the NSA gave us the encryption that we're using for the system we're using and granted i understand the computing platforms that are now because i've looked at them and i went 
when the hell would I even put this thing, much less pay the electric <laughs> bill for it? Because you're putting, what, you're ganging GPUs for people who don't know. That's a graphics processor unit. The computer I'm using right now has a very nice NVIDIA card in it that I use for rendering video. Well, ganging five or six of those together then creates what is considered now to be, I guess, a, a decent mining rig. My question is, first off, I assume that the overhead on the system can only expand as the system itself expands. It actually drops at a lower rate as the system gets larger. Okay, so it's sort of what logarithmic in terms of Correct. how it... Okay. The second thing is, and the part that makes me even more nervous is, in an era when we now have quantum computing in possession of very large corporations and government entities, how sacrosanct is the level of encryption currently in the system as a safeguard against the very same people whom we're trying to throw off now coming back in and seizing control of the system? How secure is the system? Pretty, pretty damn secure. And also, you have to understand quantum computing can't be used to crack hashes. Quantum computing is not a brute force machine. You can't say, here is a, here is a string of numbers and dehash this. The reason you can't do that is because of the basic mechanism for a hash. Let's look at it this way. While there might be a number of names, say that there were 20 secret uh, words we could make out of Danny's name, okay? And we could decode those using the same kind of an algorithm to take them out that we put them in. And there were 20 words there. Well, there might also be 500 other names that might also yield those same 20 words, okay, that are not Danny's name. So, it, so there's a huge pool on one side and then a fairly large pool on the other side of your output. And so to dehash something would require that you were able to go backwards through the algorithm to whichever one of the potentials that were in there. Now, true, quantum computing is all about what they call collapsing the potential or collapsing probability into reality. But quantum computing doesn't work as people under think. It doesn't work like ordinary computers. It's nothing at all like that. Quantum computing can be more, mostly well thought of as this. We're gonna, we've got a sheet of steel here, and we're, we're uh, omnipresent kind of beings. We can make things occur. And this is a little piece of uh, steel plate. It's a foot by foot. You know, it's about the size of a bathroom tile or something, and it's maybe um, uh, three quarters of an inch thick. We're going to heat this piece of steel up, but before we do it, we're going to put our intent into it, and we're going to ask it a question. And we're going to have that steel answer us the instant it cools off by how it arranges the atoms in it. And this is what they call quantum annealing. Now, they don't actually use a piece of steel, but it's very analogous to the process I'm describing, where we would heat up the steel with a big torch, make it all uniform hot everywhere. We all beam our thoughts into it about our question, and then we yank the torch away and hit it with ice instantly. And so we freeze its intent right, right you're there. You're annealing the metal, yeah. Okay, now what they do is they do that at a quantum level within a chip. Okay, basically, that's what they're doing inside quantum computers. So it's not a brute force kind of a thing. You can't tell it, try this hash, try that hash, try that hash, try that hash, ad infinitum to try and get through hashes. Now, here's the thing, too. The SHA-256 algorithm, it has been described, and let's just assume it's accurate, that you would have to turn your machine, if you had a way of, of a, a brute force attack against it to try and figure out what your, uh, to resolve Danny's name out of a hash, to do a brute force against it, you'd have to turn on your computer right now and have it go 100% of its CPU, 100% of its memory to the task. And then you would have to come back in about seven years and it will only be about a quarter of the way through the potentials. So the hash in terms of brute force, that's why it's so brutal. It would just take you incredible amounts of, of computing power to, to try and brute force attack on a hash. Quantum computing, theoretically, maybe if you could be, you could maybe write a program to make your piece of steel, you could maybe beam in the thoughts, okay, let's crack Cliff's uh, secret hash code here. And maybe it would pop up there. But the way quantum computing works, it's only an 80, 20% thing anyway. 80, <coughs> excuse me, 80% of the time that you fire on the quantum computer and run your program, you're gonna get an answer that's valuable to you. Not necessarily the answer. 20% of the time, it's not gonna give you anything at all except garbage. <coughs> and, these, and the quantum annealing is only one of a number of different techniques they're attempting to do. 
They're also trying to do quantum tunneling. But it is not as though they can write a program in a quantum computer, at this point anyway, that would do any kind of an attack on anybody's uh, hash or any part of the, the, um, the overall uh, encryption that's involved in any part of the system. So it, it's kind of a misnomer. It, it, we shouldn't be afraid of that, right? Uh, it, quantum computing is going to be really cool stuff, but it, it, they won't use it to be cracking hashes on your Bitcoin wallet. Okay. All right. Um, I'm just going to keep hammering in on this because I, I'm not clear how it's decentralized if it's value, if it has no inherent value. And right now, its value seems to be determined by how many US dollars or yen or rubles right. change your Bitcoin for. So how, how is it actually decentralized? Uh, it's, it's decentralized in that there's no federal authority creating new Bitcoin. The network right. algorithm it's itself. Centralized currency to have a value, correct? No, no, it's not. Because we could all decide right now that every Bitcoin is worth a million dollars or a million rocks or a million M&Ms so and it that would have work? that value. How would that work? How do we... It's called, it's called the network effect, okay? When, the, when Bitcoin first came out, this guy, Satoshi Nakamoto... How do um, we know that that's a person, by the we way? Don't, we don't, we don't. It could, could have been a group. It's a, he's anonymous. That's the whole point here. I actually think that the white paper was written by a single mind and was not group edited, simply on linguistics, okay? And do we know that it was um, of beneficent intent? Oh, sure. It's intended no. to free humans. Go and, read the white, go and read the white paper. See, what they did was, he, he came up with this idea, and he said, I know how to fix money. I know how to make money so that, that evil bastards can't control it by printing as much as they want and making us all into slaves. And here's how we fix money. And he described it. He didn't write a software program or anything. That came later. Other people also wrote their own mining programs. It's all open source. You can go and look at the code. You can compile the code and run it on your own PC. You can disassemble the outputs of the, that code and look at it and see what's going on. And you can see what it's doing. And sure, 100%. What it's doing. Yeah, see, here's the thing. Here's the thing. People, you know, people think computers are like, um, uh, a lot of people think computers are sentient. We, we shouldn't go there at all. But, but computers operate by, by one instruction at a time, one instruction at a time. Now, when I write a line of code in a chunk of software, that might compile. A compiler is a, is a thing that takes my English words or near English words and spits out machine code, all the ones and zeros, right? And it does it through these iterative steps so that the machine can understand what I'm saying. But the machine code and everything that goes on can be examined and is examined by software engineers and things called debuggers. If you're using Firefox, you hit like F12 and the JavaScript debugger comes on up and you can see the script in anybody's web page. You can debug it, you can see the code they're putting on your PC. And, and so this is like that in that sense. You can look at it. People actually have to look at it in order to get the bugs out of the code that we write. We've got to watch the inputs, watch the outputs, and say, aha, this is where I screwed up. You know, I wanted the machine to do X, Y, Z, and it did PRQ. And it was my fault, so I changed the code and I fix it. And so because it's open source, there's no trickery. There's no, no um, uh, hidden agenda there. And it's all network effect. One guy came up with the idea. Somebody else read the white paper and said, damn, this is smart. I came along maybe 35 or 4,500 users later or readers later and I read it and I said, damn, this is just the, this is it. This is the thing. And so shortly thereafter, people started saying, well, hey, I'm going to write this code and make it work and see what happens. And pretty soon other people were doing it. And then we had people that were mining. Everybody agreed on the protocols. A group formed and they called themselves, you know, the Bitcoin Collective or something. Other people decided that, well, hey, we can use this this way. Bitcoins were being mined. It was fun. We could transact back and forth. We could sign things with our Bitcoin wallets so that we knew we were talking to each other. We, we started establishing the trust in the system that we didn't have to have in the people on the other end. So it's a kind of a situation like this. When you buy something through Amazon and you're dealing with a Chinese retailer, you may or may not get what you're, what you're, you're expecting. And it has uh, to do with the trust aspect of it. You have to, and Amazon spends a fortune dealing with such issues. All the fraud call, uh, calls, all of the people saying, you know, item not as received or, or not as warranted, all of this kind of stuff. And it's, so it's trust. And it's trust in a digital world is very, very, very valuable, increasingly so. And so if you ha can have trust in the system, you need not worry about the personality on the other end of that. 
if they're a false dealer, the system will protect you. And the system is decentralized because no one owns it. I can write my own mining code, set up my own uh, GPU bank here and have at it. And Randy, by the way, you don't think of them the right way. You plug them in and you think of them as a house heater. <laughs> <laughs> Very expensive house heater, by the way. But hey, hey, let me tell you, I know I know a guy that did that though. He plugged in a bunch of them. He mined Ethereum this past January, or uh, past uh, in the last part of 2016. And then I talked to him in January, and then he told me his uh, take in March after he'd done his done his taxes and stuff. And so he heated his house for free, and he netted over a hundred thousand dollars in Ethereum mining. <laughs> oh, no, believe me, the geek in me totally wants to do this. Yeah, I, I, but I find it forbidding in the sense that I get the sense that now the, 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 the bar is raised so high. Is this competitive? In other words, if I'm sitting here and I'm puking out little bit streams with my pathetic little rig that has two NVIDIA cards on it, and the guy across the country is sitting there with uh, all lined up with a 12 bank with all the newest AMD processors stacked up in this mother and he's rolling. Is he outflanking me? Am, am, am I just like, sure? Sure. Uh, okay. But you're not, you're not out of, you're not out of luck here. Okay. Because you, this, you'd have to just be smart about it. You just don't want to mine Bitcoin when you've got people over in China that have got whole buildings flooded with oil. That's how they're trying to take the heat off of them is using oil cooled CPUs. So they've got serious investment there. In Russia, they're putting in a half a million, I think, so another half million. So this thing has already kind of gone out of the domain of the everyman and into the world. No, of no, it's actually, I would dispute that. Okay, what's actually happened is that Bitcoin is now taking the uh, emotional place of gold. And we have a vying of uh, other alts for the emotional place of silver. But in fact, you're, you're wrong. The opposite has occurred. It has flattened out into more into every man because now you have people that are selling mining rigs so that you as a geek wouldn't have to put your own together. You wouldn't have to know the co source code. These guys give you the code to mine and so on. They tell you, uh, you know, how to set up the systems and so on. Now it's also going into other alts, other coins. So there's other hashes to be done where the payoff is not as big, but because there's fewer people out there doing it, the proportionality payoff is larger. And it's going to keep going that now way. Now you just walked us into the next conundrum as I see it. And Danny, don't let me, feel free to jump in, dear. We now are at a place where we have hundreds of platforms, several thousand coins and coins being issued. I'm sitting here. I'm looking at this website. It's Coin called, market cap. Uh, crypto, <laughs> crypto coin new, CryptoCoinsNews.com, which is one of them that I follow. And every day there's new offerings, there's new platforms. People don't even seem to understand that Ethereum is a platform. It's not technically a coin the way Bitcoin is a coin. So we're now, we're now flush with all of these choices, but we don't really have a base level by which to make choices. Bitstream is the big dog in, 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 the, in the pound right now, but we're not at the point where we're selling this to quote the majority of people. No, we're, we're talking about this in kind of a, a, a much smaller strata of the, of, of both the economy and even of the internet world itself. So as we're sorting this out, I kind of view what we're doing now as the vetting that's not being done by the mainstream media. This is where yeah. we step in, talk to people like you, kick this around, get pissed off about it, go, I don't want to hear fucking Bitcoin ever again and get disgusted and go have a beer. But right. at the end of the day, we're still talking about it because it sits out there looming over us like a colossus and we want to know. We got to solve this. Well, the problem, the problem too is that we have to, we need to have um, a description of the landscape we're walking, okay? Yeah. A lot of people, you say certain names and they think they're coins, they're not sure what a coin is even, and so on. Danny has to be commended, okay? Because she's what we're going to think of as the very 
early edge of, a, of the early adopters. I've been inv involved in technology for a long time, and there's a particular adoption pattern that goes through the society, no matter what the technology is, and it starts off with one or two guys with cell phones willing to pay $1,900 to lug these things around in their cars with, you know, a big brick and a, and a telephone, and you're paying $500 a month for these things. Yeah, I had a phone that big at one time. Lunch right, box. right. I had this There's thing, and every box. time I fired yeah. it up in the car, I was afraid I was irradiating yeah. myself, <laughs> you know. And you but, were. But, I was, yeah. Uh, but now look at it, you know, now we're kicking out, we can kick out a half a billion cell phones a year. All right. So that's, that's the rate of adoption from say 1989 when I had my first one up to 2018. And that would be a far spread. Okay. But, but there's a particular range there. There's early adopters who are, who are like myself, who don't really give a rat's ass about looking goofy. And so we try this stuff just to see what's going to happen. And then after enough of us do this, then smart people are saying, okay, like Danny, she's sitting there thinking, all right, these guys are not stupid. You know, there's got to be something there for these people to keep playing with this this long. Maybe I'd better go see what's there and try and understand what their thinking is on this, right? And she's that, that wary edge of what we think of as the early adopters. And the early adopter phase of this is really, really cool. Because in technology going through anything, you know when, you've, when you reach early adopter phase, when these people who are out there watching other people do it with this skeptical eye, and yet they're continually moved closer to it because there's got to be something there. And when they get to that stage, the early adopters represent a giant leap in the number of people involved. And it's, we go from innovators to early adopters to mainstream to follow on. Now, we're nowhere near mainstream, right? Most of the planet hasn't heard of, of cryptocurrencies at all. But enough people have that we're leaving the innovators and we're going to go into the early adopter phase. And so we'll see uh, at the end of the early adopter phase, let's call it two years, two and a half years from now, because in, things happen really fast in crypto world. Maybe we're going to burn through uh, what would otherwise have been a decade. Maybe we're going to do it in a couple of years. Took 20 years for the phones themselves to get to where they are now. But with software, you don't have these lag times of hardware development, sales, all of that. All we have here is creation of the things with the new software tools and then the sales of, of our concept and our ideas into the marketplace of everybody else's attention. So you can think of this as an attention market, all right? Humans putting their attention to something, putting their thoughts and energy into something is valuable, even if someone else can't necessarily see the intrinsic value of where those thoughts are being directed at this point. But that, that wave, the rapidity with which we'll go through that is going to be very, very fast. So in, in two years or so, we'll be producing uh, a half a billion people coming into cryptocurrencies in a year instead of just a few hundred thousand new ones coming into a year. And look at the excitement that only a few hundred thousand new ones being added to our millions already involved. Look at the excitement that that's generating. A lot of that has to be done, dealt with, though. In, under, the, under the concept that we're in a system that is dying, and we all recognize this. Everybody recognizes it in their guts. That's why our society is all twisted up now is because of the emotional load of us bearing this dying system. And so there's a lot of us that are no longer wrapped up in, in, in the negative aspects of it. We're all whipped up in the positive aspects because we've shifted over to building the system that will exist when that other one crashes. Well. Cliff, let me ask you, given that no fiat currency has ever sustained, and this is another one, why would this one last? Because the, the failure in fiat currencies in the past has been dilution, has been the ability of a central authority to sneakily dilute them. So that one of them was the denarius in Rome. Rome fell not because the barbarians in, in uh, Germany came on down and kicked the shit out of, of the Romans. Rome fell because over the course of about 50 to 80 years, they took it from uh, X amount of silver in a denarius down to 2% of that. They diluted it. They stole from the people. Repeatedly, that always happens when you have a central authority. Look at what's happening right now. We start off in 1913 with a dollar being able to purchase, um, uh, you know, 20, gallon, 20 gallons of gas in 1913. You can't get 20 gallons of gas out of a dollar now. The value in that currency has been stolen from us by the central authorities. All but right. It's not possible to hack in and chain and dilute. No, it's not possible because it's a consensus algorithm. 
because you can hack in and you can change my computer and no, none of the other computers would give a rat's ass. They'd say, ah, you've been hacked. You know, you're out of sync with the time. See, it comes back to time. What makes this all possible, Satoshi came up with this brilliant idea and it's all synchronized on global time in a, in a single clock. So all of the computers that are working on the blockchain are all syncing on an individual uh, sequence of time. And so any one of them can be hacked and it won't make any difference at all because the mere process of hacking it takes it out of sequence of all of the others. And even if it wasn't, even if it was a, uh, uh, in identically in sequence with all the others and came up and put its block out there, if its block is disagreed, if you have a version on your PC of our transaction and it's different from my version and mine was the real version, so to speak, then mine will be in the consensus and the consensus will spit yours back out as deliberate trash. It's self-protecting because, because of the way the algorithm is written, this consensus algorithm. So there's these various layers to it. It's, it's so tricky. It's kind of like if in a situation where if, there, if there's a group of people and everybody knows the truth, and then one person starts saying, no, that's not the truth and makes up something else. Well, if everybody else has already agreed on what the truth is, they're just gonna say that person is lying. It's that, okay, got, okay, I got that. I have a couple of questions now, and maybe, and I think, Danny and Randy, maybe you can help me with some of these also. But these, like, these are my questions about it. Um, the first one is, since the system requires, since the mining of Bitcoin and all this stuff requires so much energy, why is this a good use of energy? If, as they say, and I'm not saying that I believe this, that we have limited amount of energy, energy is a precious resource, and we have to limit how much each person can use, why is doing all this c computations and whatever a good use of energy? That's Okay, because of efficiency, all right? Because it may sound goofy, but the more energy we put into the hashing, so that, that actually makes us more efficient because we don't have to trust the system thereafter. We can remove whole layers of middlemen. So there's, the, there's Bitcoin, but, but Bitcoin runs on a blockchain. The consensus algorithm is run through the blockchain, all these computers agreeing on it. And so under the circumstances, we put energy into the hash to ensure the blockchain so that we have trust and so that we have rep reparability. That is, you, you keep, can replicate this thing throughout the entire blockchain and know that the code is safe and you don't have to worry about it and so on. And because of that, we can be very efficient. And so we can eliminate huge layers of government. We can eliminate okay. huge layers of waste. <clears throat> and so we'll recapture that energy in being much more efficient human civilization. Okay, that, 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 that's interesting. Okay, then the next question is this. If this is an egalitarian thing, but already we're having this situation where, like Randy was talking about, there's these people who have these huge computer units to do this stuff, and you know, I just have my little MacBook, or Danny has her MacBook, or whatever. What, wouldn't it be like something obvious that would happen that the same fuckers that are ruining everything now, the same fuckers that have all the money and the access to the free te energy technology that they're not sharing with us, would use that free energy technology to be able to uh, run their machines on that without having to pay for the same energy that you and I would have to pay for if we tried to run a huge computer at our house to do this. They sure, could they, could, they could do that and they'd make right. a couple of Bitcoin. They'd make a few thousand dollars. The, the uh, economy of effort required to do it wouldn't be paid off because of the nature of this being a consensus. So, okay, so, so even, though, even though they could, because they have more energy and can have a bigger computer and therefore could mine more Bitcoin, it wouldn't matter? Okay, it doesn't quite work that way that you can mine more Bitcoin because see, you okay. can't mine blocks ahead of everybody else. It's not who has the fastest uh, machine, see? It's a cooperative thing it's called the okay. consensus. So, oh, so, we, okay. Okay. so unless there was a whole entire network of people who all had those that were all Correct, doing, and this okay. brings us into the 50, what's called the 51% issue, right? That was the big failure that everybody saw existing within Satoshi Nakamoto's design. If you got 51% of all the miners to agree to do X, Y, Z, then the network would shift over. And that's quite true. If you could get 51% of all the mining capacity to agree on a specific thing, then you could get that done. But the likelihood of that, as we've seen in reality, is pretty small. So how would, how would they get consensus? How would they, they swing that? Is there like a board meeting? Are they getting no, no, no. together online? I mean, what it's is an algorithm. That? It's an algorithm. Okay. It's, okay. Okay. it's just strictly an algorithm. Okay. <laughs> see, that's what we have to agree here is that, and see, here's the part of it that really gets annoying. I go out and I vet a lot of tokens because I can, tokens are different than coins. A token is a representation of a company's willingness to, do, to uh, go out and do a business. And it's basically the new evolution of what we used to think of as a share in a company. 
<clears throat> the beauty of a token is if you, okay in the past you would be given a, a share in a company you could buy shares in a company right mm -hmm. now nowadays we can see that the cryptocurrency landscape is split in half or split into two parts one part is the real coins that are intended to be a currency back and forth that the vast majority of them though are tokens the vast majority of them are companies that like Populous, okay? They're, I know Populous, uh, this guy out of London. This guy out of London's got a really good idea. He says, I can make a system, I can make a chunk of software that will take banks out of the picture and will allow somebody in London to loan money to a business in, in Bangladesh or Bangkok and cut the interest rates, cut the middlemen, cut the bankers' uh, huge fat bonuses, get rid of any racial uh, issues there at all, and uh, simplify the whole system and make it cheaper for the guy to borrow money. He pays less interest. And yet the guy on the other end in this peer-to-peer -peer lending approach, he gets a, a decent rate of return on loaning money to this business in Bangladesh. And we get an experience rating. I can do all of this on software. And so Populous has this idea and he writes it up in a white paper, just like uh, Satoshi wrote up the whole idea for Bitcoin. And so he says, let's do this. Let's, let me make this software that will allow peer-to-peer -peer factoring. A factoring is when a business gets into, needs money to go from month to month to make payroll and then collect on the invoice, right? It's short-term money, extremely short-term, but it's like 28% of global banking profit. And, it's, and the way they take it, it's like, you wouldn't believe the fees. It, they just come and rape people totally, just totally loot them for this. And so this guy, Stephen Nico Williams, he comes up with it because he's a data nut. He understands the data. He understands how to, the weakness in the system was, who do you know, or how do you know you're dealing with someone legit? And he's got this figured all out. And so he's writing software. But in order to finance this, in order to hire the programmers and that kind of stuff, he needs money. But the bankers aren't going to loan him money because he's going to put them out of business. So he decides he's going to offer a token. And then he's going to make that token. Uh, he's going to offer a certain number of these tokens. And he's going to put these tokens into his platform for the lending. So if you buy his tokens, you can be a lender to somebody and you can get passive income. And, and, and you've got to go read his white paper. He's really, really uh, sharp on this. I've interviewed him. He's really a cool guy. But anyway, the idea is that you're buying these tokens. And as he brings his software online, the value of those tokens go up in U.S. dollar terms because they become useful. You'll be able to use those tokens to buy the right, so to speak, to loan somebody some money and get uh, that money back plus interest. And nowadays, the banks are paying 0.005% or something outrageously low. You might get 8 or 10% interest on your money. And so you, you can actually earn interest and you can get yield. The whole world is starved for yield. And so uh, he's got a good idea. And the beauty of all of this is, unlike a shares market, he doesn't have to go through venture capitalists. He doesn't have to go through bankers to ultimately reach the stage where he does what's known as an IPO or an initial public offering. Instead, he does an initial coin offering, an ICO. And he's offering these tokens. And you go and you buy these tokens. And he gets the money to hire the programmers and actually do the work and produce the business. When he brings his product out, uh, right now, they have speculative value. We're all betting on Stephen Nico Williams getting this software done. We've looked at his code. It looks good. We know who his programmers are. We're vetting all of this as it goes on because the system is all transparent. And so we're saying among us, hey, these tokens are pretty valuable right now. He's getting it together. We're going to get that software. When that software comes on out and goes into production and there's peer-to-peer -peer lending, then those tokens become even more valuable. And so there's a market that naturally occurs as people want to trade tokens based on their emotions relative to Stephen and, and his work and how they think it's going. If you're bummed out one day, oh, I want to just dump all my populace, you'll take this amount for them and it creates a, it's an emotional thing. This is what markets are. And so that occurs that way. And that's what the tokens part of this is. So there's maybe, let's just call them, say, 20 actual coins or currencies. And all the rest of the thousand plus that are out there now are tokens that are representing some aspect of, of potential within businesses. And um, what percentage of those tokens are the people actually following through on what they're promising? Well, we don't know yet because all this is only six months old. <laughs> we've only just started this see but here's the thing we've been doing with i i started interviewing about bitcoin in 2013 people said i was crazy they said it was going to go away that all those the exchanges would crash and i said no it's software you know it, we fix it we make it better and it goes and it goes and people get involved with it and it's a it's a really software is an interesting world okay because it's an interesting ecosystem 
I came up in the, one of the fiercest parts of the software jungle, which was Microsoft in the early days, which is the culture of smart. You would have to you'd get up with an idea and you'd go on in there and you might have to face down 20, 30 other people equally as smart. They're going to try and rip your idea to shreds, just tear it down. Just, and, and they were just brutal and, and it was a terrible uh, organism fight there. I mean, you know, it's almost like gladi gladiator uh, battles over ideas, but it produces really sharp thinking really sharp ideas. It's a little bit more toned down now, but you'll still get the, your guts ripped open if you've got a good idea and you left out two or three uh, major things or you missed this idea or whatever. Somebody on the internet's going to come on in there and, and point it out to you in a really sharp, nasty way. And so the, the idea about all of this is that the, the ecosystem itself is self-protecting and we get better at it as we go along. And so when these people crap out, well, the next time that if, if say that you put money into it and the idea doesn't fly, well, that's just like putting money into a, to a company that didn't make it. In the early days, like 1885 to, to 1895, there were 120 plus car companies in the United States, 120 uh, companies trying to make cars. In the end, we end up with what, four, basically 50 years later. Okay, so if you put your money into, you know, Studebaker, well, you lasted a few years, you know, if you put your, your money into Stanley Steamers, or into that crazy idea of those aluminum cars powered by batteries, that only lasted like seven years. So, you know, so you just, you, it happens all the time that people pick bad ideas. Right at this point, I think it's possible because we're dealing with software, and we know the capabilities, et cetera, and some of the pitfalls and so on. If you're astute about it, you can pick up on who's going to be the next Google. Who's going to be the next Amazon? That sort of thing, right? And so, so it's a crapshoot, but it's an intelligent kind of a crapshoot where you can put your thoughts and energy and, and analysis into it and eliminate some of the wastage along the way. So it seems like it's just going to be a matter of time before the dying dinosaur is going to try to shove its nose in crypto and fuck it up. I'm curious if I'm... Uh, it's already sort of happened. Right. So if I'm mining, if I'm mining crypto and some sort of illegal activity is, uh, is happening as far as me recording that transaction, is there a way that I would somehow be implicated if that I would? No, you don't, you don't ever see the code. You have no idea what's going on. You just turn a machine on and, and that's it. So you're not, you're, you're not culpable. Is my IP address connected to the transaction that's being recorded? Nope. Nope. Because it doesn't operate on IP addresses, it operates on these hash codes. IP addresses are superfluous. So in other words, you might use an IP address for, say, two-party validation or something at a web app, but you're not going to use it within your, your crypto mining at that level. Um, so, no, so you don't have to worry that about that. You could be running a VPN, so you yeah. would already have dodged, yeah. ducked and dodged the IP address anyway. Okay. So then this brings me to my next, the next sort of part of this, and that is, you know, I'm just one of those people that money, I guess the money is, and money and things like this, it's not my most interesting or favorite topic. I don't care about it that much, but I had my interest peaked quite high this week when that, that segment came out with Jason Goodman and Quinn Michaels. And just to be clear, I'm not a fan of Jason Goodman. I find him obnoxious and I'd never heard of Quinn Michaels before. So I have no investment in him or I, like I don't, I'm not a follower. I don't know. But a lot of the, I read that you had the first comment with the most replies to it under his video clip and that you said that, um, <laughs> that they were so, he was wrong on so many things in the first 14 minutes that you couldn't get past it. But actually the most interesting parts came after the, the first 14 minutes. And I can't ignore the fact. And I think that, I've had a lot of interaction with some of our listeners over the last week in talking about this. So I think I'm not speaking for them, but I'm going to, this is a lot of our concerns. The things that he was talking about intuitively are all the things that I have always been concerned about with Bitcoin. Like I, I don't have any, I've thought about buying it before. I could buy some. I'm one of those people, like I'm really good at saving money, even, you know, so it sucks that you can't make any interest in the bank. And so it would be better if I could make, have something to make interest at. But there's always been this intuitive block that tells me that there's something, and I don't mean moral and like this is morally right or morally wrong, but there's something not right about this. There's something that is, you know, it, that is giving some part of ourselves over to technology on a level beyond what I'm comfortable with. The hulking the, colossus known as AI. The AI thing, Because right. we're so, talking about it, and unfortunately you can't duck this. 
there's a, a huge amount of paranoia. Let's define it. Let, let's define it, okay? Well, hold, let, me, let me just finish real, like, my thought real fast here. Yeah, yeah. So we'll this whole that. thing with AI, like when he was talking, it was like as, as imperfect and obnoxious as either or both of them may be. I was, this was thinking, this is all of the things that I have intuitively thought. These are all of my concerns. And he's talking about this in a way that like links that all together. And so this, I think this, these videos brought this kind of conversation to a little bit of a fever pitch this week. Sure. And, and um, that's my whole concern with this. Like intuitively for me, the Bitcoin has always been a no because it feels like participating in some kind of AI takeover that we may not be able to pull ourselves back from. I, I don't know if I'm right well, about We're that. already there. Okay, so let, let's right. examine a couple of things here real quick. First off, let's, let's consider, just ask ourselves without answering it, why yeah. that video, why that language, why it was structured that way, and why now? It had no fact in it. All it was was his uh, statements with no backing or anything. And he used linguistics very well in the sense that he spoke directly to your fears. That's his whole point. That's all right. he was there to do sure, was I to hide your fear. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah of course. All right. So let's, let's allay the fears a bit, all right? Uh, artificial intelligence in the sense of a sentient machine does not exist. There's a lot of people out there that are writing artificial intelligence, and I'm involved in writing code and have been in the past that was within what we call artificial intelligence. But these were expert systems. They were intended to mimic the way that human thoughts go. Okay. Right. Now, here's, let me point out a couple of- How are you sure. defining sentient being? Okay, that with, I was just gonna do that, okay? It's, okay, so here's the thing. Software can only do what software is programmed to do. It cannot reach outside of itself. It can't make any decisions. That's what, what a sentient being can do. It can change its thoughts. Software cannot, okay? Software can only do what I put into it. No piece of software can ever change itself. No piece of software can ever make a decision other than what is within its code. And that decision process is not emotional. It's not made. It's simply which co code bit executes next. And in fact, that's how crackers work. That's how the hackers and the exploiters work. They throw in some kind of input to disrupt that this line, the next line, next line, in order to get the computer open and then they can get access to the RAM. That all exploits come down to that, making the step by step by step. So computers do not think there's no mentition there whatsoever. They execute instructions one at a time. These instructions work by moving bits back and forth in, in a little tiny chip. And they do it so fast that we can get them to do things such as transmit video in real time and, and, and do things to respond to our inputs. But all computing process you know, in our country right now, you talk about energy. YouTube is the largest waster of energy that there <laughs> is. Because see, here's the thing. It's all computers spend most of their time of their, of their code in wait. They're just waiting for input, waiting for your keyboard, waiting for your mouse to move, waiting for something to happen for them to react to, for the software to react to. The software reacts. The computers have no uh, self. They have, it, it's impossible to have a self-aware computer. You cannot have, it can't exist. There's no self to be aware of. Software cannot be aware of itself and it can therefore not change itself. It has no, uh, um, ability to make a decision. If we really think about it, we can look at this in a, in a particular way. What actually happens in a human being when you remove a particular part of its mind related to emotion? When you do that, com the human being can't make decisions because you can actually do things where people have been damaged mentally and they're unable to make decisions and someone has to say, eat this or choose that, pick this yeah. up because they have no input in their, in their emotional part of their bodies to make them make a decision one over the other. A computer is very much like that. It's a very stupid machine doing things very fast. And so it's fancy, it's splashy and so on, but it's really stupid. I mean, it's incredibly dumb in what it does. It's an abacus that goes back and forth really fast. And then we've added layers of abstraction. Us humans have added layers of abstraction on top of the abacus so that we can trick ourselves in, in writing our software to create real-time motion and all of this. And the software could <clears throat> no more change itself. Uh, it, it's simply impossible to do so. So AI defined as software making a decision or, or attempting to act in any way, any way, other than what is absolutely programmed within it, does not exist. It's a fear that has been built into us by the pre-programming in the media, but it does not exist. Anyway. So what, 
So, I that. Sorry, Emily, but I, I did, and Cliff, like my, my knowledge of technology is obviously pales in comparison to yours, but um, I read in Wired Magazine like at least six months ago that programmers were losing their jobs because now computers were operating in such a way that they were teaching themselves and they were expanding their intelligence and that the people in charge didn't even know how they were figuring out what they're figuring out. Okay, those are called neural nets and machine learning. And you're correct to a certain extent, okay? Machine learning really is about learning the repetition uh, and, the, and the processes that humans go through. And we've come up with an interesting way to do it called neural nets in their analogs. And that is, uh, I don't need to go into the details, but it's sort of, a, it's sort of a, the article in Wired was wrong because computers don't have any intelligence. They have a database. They have a register. They have a screen. They have an input from a keyboard and a mouse. They have Wi-Fi, this kind of thing. But they don't have any intelligence. They have RAM, random access memory. But that RAM is simply a state that holds certain numbers. So computers have no intelligence whatsoever. All they're doing is filling their database up with more and more stuff from which they can, can choose, so to speak, from which a programmer can, can order the software to examine a wider range of potential responses to human interaction. One of these ways that they can do this is to get out, uh, humans out of the process, and this is why programmers were losing their job, of writing all this repetitious code. So when I, when I was doing a lot of my programming, graphic user interfaces didn't exist. It was impossible to send video. There was no mouse movement, any of this. I wrote to a CRT screen. I moved things around. When the first, I remember when the first <laughs> Windows came out and we went through Windows 3.1, which was just great, and then Windows 98. And, and it was a bunch of conventions created by our software engineers. But, but now we've got code. Because we've got this code base, we're able to tell software to go back through the code base, use this code base this way, and eliminate having to redo all of that each and every time. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel for each and every one of the programs we're writing. And so that's why programmers are losing their jobs, because their jobs are being automated. That part of it that is not creative. But, but no, no software is machine learning anything that relates to, to anything on an emotional level, and they're not doing anything that's creative. So they're, they're not able to create. All they're able to do is repeat and they can repeat actions. So you can get a computer to take my picture and make my arm go up and down, up and down, and up and down. But it, it's unable to do anything other than the repetition of that motion. And you can do things like you could make my hand green, but the computer could not decide, the software could not decide to make my hand green in, in doing that replication. All the, all, the, all the machines can do is replicate. So there is no AI in the terms of a, of a software making um, assumptions and, and that sort of thing. There is AI in the sense of marketing efforts to think to hype up software that has greater and greater capabilities because now programmers are sitting on a mountain of pre-existing, pre-tested software from which we can take chunks to build things much more rapidly, much more robust with far less effort. Sort of makes sense? Which actually was a dream back in the 90s when we were talking the early stages of object-oriented programming exactly. and modularity yeah. and all of that. Yeah. 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 Libraries. 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 <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Code, code bases that you could pick and choose yeah. modular. Aspects. It was so tedious. Oh, it was so tedious. I hated doing the, <clears throat> the UI work. Even working at Microsoft in the day, every single project, you had to rewrite all the code to take input. You had to rewrite all the code to process the input. And then they would change the language on you that you were using or change some of the metaphors and you'd have to do it all over again. And so we spent a lot of our, our early years writing code to take in users' names and addresses and all this kind of stuff just to store in the damn database. So maybe I can take this. Looking at the landscape right now, and, and the word speculation came up earlier. Right now, I would say that this is probably the, the, the casino on steroids in one, one respect when I look at the Bitcoin world. We're mainlining, because, dude. We're because, mainlining. <laughs> because basically nobody knows what the payoff is. Right? I, I just had somebody, I was in a conversation yesterday with a friend out in Los Angeles, and he kept talking about the two Bitcoin millionaires. And I'm like, well, how do you know they're Bitcoin millionaires? And he said, well, they're, they're Bitcoin guys and they're millionaires. And I said, so they cashed out? And he's like, 
Well, I don't know. He said there, they, there's something with Bitcoin. So there's this, there's this perception of a looming technorati that sits out there that are the early, let's say, cash outs from Bitcoin who create this new class, this new, we'll call it an elite class. I don't have a problem with the word. And there is a paranoia about this. I'm not against the idea of people making money. I guess where I'm going with this, it goes back to speculation. Again, we are betting massively on something that we don't know what the outside potential is, nor do we know, again, going back to some of Danny's arguments, the intrinsic, or maybe I should say inherent value of this system that is now being created. In other words, what is this going to look like? Is it going to be the great tulip bulb bust of 1840, or is it going to be yeah. the gold rush? Or we, Okay, we have, the, we have a binary state uh, potential. Bitcoin and all the cryptocurrencies could go to zero. Yeah. In, order for that to, in order for that to happen, everybody that's messing with them now would have to stop messing with them because the only thing that gives them value now is all of us messing about with them. All right, that's what it comes down to. It's confidence. And so the same thing will occur and is occurring for the US dollar. And in the sense that real soon, the confidence in the dollar is gonna be down to the point where it will be worth zero. And you're gonna need some other alternative. And you could have more confidence in gold or, or silver or a shovel or a gun or a bullet so or something like system that. Prepared, is the system prepared for the day when the dollar is completely finally, we finally figured out that it's worthless because we're basing Bitcoin. Which, which right, system? The Bitcoin the dollar system? system? The dollar system. Okay. So the dollar system bottoms, it hits bottom. It's worthless. People are just throwing it in the streets. You know, the dogs can piss on it. But at that point, we have to assign values. We need numbers. We need something. First off, human beings are tactile beings. We have been walking around with wallets in our pockets and cash and coins in our hand. We're used to tactile. No, no, you're wrong. Our okay. generation, dude, our generation. Look at it. Look at all the people that don't walk around that have, ne had, have never had coins, have never held a coin that had real silver, of course, but even people that don't really carry coins and everything, they deal with plastic. So we're a plastic society now in the main. Go to even China. A, they don't, go to China. They don't even use plastic. They credit use phones. Tactile. You know, they right. went out of their way. They put holograms and they gave you these cards. They, they, right. They've done everything they can to keep us associating value with something that we hold no, in our hands. No, you have to look at it a different way. Okay? okay. And that is that humans are somewhat dense. Okay. So we've all used, we've all gone to a shopping center and we've all used these little uh, transport vehicles in our dealing with the local exchange that we call the grocery store. These transport vehicles are provided to us free. These transport vehicles we've all used. We've handled them all of our lives. All right. We call these things shopping carts. They, they're little metal baskets with wheels, right? Mm -hmm. These are transport vehicles. Would it shock you to know that it took two years for shopping carts to be introduced into the first stores and accepted? Would it shock you to know that those stores had to pay people to walk around with the cars and carts and pretend to shop in order for other people to become accustomed to using shopping carts? And now shopping carts are ubiquitous. Even homeless people can have shopping carts, right? <laughs> okay, so you see the point. Humans, humans have to be taught things. So we were taught to use plastics. We were taught to use direct deposits. You don't, mostly, they want a cashless society. So I agree with you that, but it's not, it's not, uh, we're not tactile beings anymore in that sense. That was our generation. I like the feel of gold and silver coins, but I know in my life I'm not going to be spending them. You know, and here's the thing. We're, we're actually at that binary path. Bitcoin goes to zero and it crashes and we're in Mad Max world. There is no other alternative to that because the dollar is dying. And in our country, when the dollar dies, we don't have the option of having a, and, and when this happens, empires are in the, always in their worst possible state. And the empire crashes when its money crashes because of the deb debasement and corruption that's been going on for all the years to get to the point that the stuff crashes. Bitcoin will last longer because there's nobody to debase it. There's nobody to be corrupt and change it. It's an algorithm. It's math. It's precious numbers that have to be computed. And so it's trustworthy because we know there's nobody up there 
you know, taking the silver out of the coin to make another coin to be richer and, and game the system. And so at this point, we're, we're still in the, in the phase of teaching people to push the cart through the store and put their stuff in it. And, and we see how rapidly the idea can now spread because we're becoming, as a social order, as beings, more used to the idea of absorbing new ideas. We have shopping carts on virtual state, right? And we had to be taught to use those, et cetera, et cetera. It's just a progression. And you could argue that this is the evil new world order. And I get lots of Christians that, you know, are condemning me to hell for supporting the uh, mark of the beast and all of this kind of thing, right? <laughs> And, and, you know, they're almost as bad as the blue chicken people and what they're trying to do to me at any event. So the, the point, though, is that we're at a progression and we basically can choose. And we can choose to think of a world that's going to eventually crash out and be Mad Max world where, where we will, as, as individuals, will probably die. Because none of us seem to be the kind that go and cut somebody's throat and then eat their liver just to survive, right? And so... Under the circumstances. You, you, don't, you don't know Randy then, you know. <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't know my liver, so. <laughs> but, but you see my point, right? Or we can actually choose now to co-opt what's going on because the, the federales, the cabal, whatever you want to call them, the bad guys, they want a cashless society that they control that's digitally centralized around the, the Federal Reserve's replacement. Which they they wanted, had. Did, did they want theirs to be more like a prepaid debit card? Like that's what they wanted. Correct, their debit correct, card. correct. And, that's, yeah. and they were calling it the SDR and all of this kind of stuff, yeah. right? And it's yeah. failing because we've all decided at the software level, nah, we don't want to play with your software. It's not interesting. It's pre-mined. You can control it better that we play with our own algorithms. We're going our own way. It's we're sidestepping the, the bad guys, so to speak, and creating our own system as we go along. And I say we, because anybody that wants to participate can go to GitHub and look at the, any of these tokens and see the code. You know, there's all these repositories. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. another, another disturbing, I'm Hang sorry. Hang on a second, Danny. Danny. It just feels very binary. Like, it does. like Mad Max world, dollar crashing or crypto or we're fucked. And I feel like, there's an infinite realm of possibility in between. And, and I hear you keep calling this progress. And I wanna to speak to what Emily brought up before. Um, and for me, in, as Emily, as you were struggling for the word or looking for the word, I felt like it feels like anti-life. And my experience with it is, I've been in crypto for about a year and I was invited to steam it last week. And as I was going through all the Steemit protocols and clicking the dumb arrows and setting my you know, watch for eight minutes, I was like, this is not the best use of my genius, of my life, of time to bring it back to time. Like, this is actually sucking the life out of me and it's treating me like a computer. And as I hear you describing crypto, it feels anti-life. There's no value. I don't see how it's helping humanity. I see where it's taking energy, consuming a lot of energy to try to convince me that this is a wise choice, even though it's based on mistrust. But it all feels very anti-life and I don't see how it's helping humanity. I don't see how, I don't actually see where it's progress. I certainly see where it's an alternative to a really corrupt system, but I I don't see the value. I don't see how it's moving us forward. Okay. Enough. Well, here's, here's our problem then. Here's, right. here's our fundamental problem at that level. Um, we, have a, we have a reality and we can ignore the reality all we want. But unfortunately, we cannot ignore the consequences of ignoring reality. So I, I can certainly see how you feel that way because that's an emotional response and you don't like being put through uh, and your mind does not like being uh, made to follow a programmer, uh, his diktat in terms of dealing with the arrows and stuff at Steemit. I don't like Steemit. It's a, it's a goofy system, but that's that aside. Um, our problem is this right now, uh, over half of the people that are existing on this planet exist because of debt that sometime in the 1930s, it was decided that we would boost the population. And so the debt machine was rolled out. And so you have never, ever worked on a currency that had any intrinsic value at all. It didn't even have trust because it was debt and they did not trust you. And you live in a system that's entirely based on mistrust. You've got to have a driver's license to identify yourself to cash a check. 
You've got to have this ID to deal with these people. You've got to have this other ID to deal with these other people. Your whole life is surrounded by mistrust. There's no life enhancing aspect of the DMV. There's no life enhancing aspect of dealing with any of these other systems that are sucking the life out of you now in their digital fa fashion anyway. So you have to recognize that you're, you're in this reality at this stage. We all collectively have to realize that when, when the debt system crashes, the just-in-time supply system crashes with it. So when the debt system goes, when the dollar goes, there's no pop, there's no water at the store, nothing is delivered, there's no gas in the, in the gas pumps to put into your machine. Maybe, depending on where you're living, you can't even charge your Prius because there's no electricity going through the wires, your refrigerator shuts off and the internet goes away, and you just simply wait to die under some form of very uh, uncomfortable conditions. Because this binary system exists of us being so overloaded on this planet and we've brought so many people ahead in time, so to speak, with the debt system making people feel good about having children and raising families and expanding and so on. The debt system allowed that to occur and we doubled our population from World War II to now, more than doubled it. And so we can say that half of those people right there would not have existed without debt. And they're going to have to die the minute that the debt system uh, goes. And a lot of the other people are also going to die along with them because the debt system supports us all. And so unless we have an alternative to that debt system, we can write off. And, and if we don't do this, cryptos are actually life enhancing because they're against the new world order. They're against depopulation. They allow us to keep the system going in spite of the fact that, that there's no intrinsic worth in them in your view. There's no intrinsic worth in a dollar. There's no intrinsic worth in the digit that's recorded as a digi dollar in your bank account. And they can make it go away like that. The good part of Bitcoin is they can't make my Bitcoin go away. They can't make my Ethereum go away. They can't make your, uh, they you know, cut off all the power. then they're going to die too. If, if the power goes, we've got a lot more things to worry about than cryptocurrencies. You will die as well. Millions of people will die within the first nine days as they uh, uh, cease to live in hospitals without that electricity. So they but won't cut the power off in order to kill Bitcoin if that's what you're worried about. But it sounds like everything you're saying as far as, affirming crypto's awesomeness is all in comparison to the shitty dollar. Right. And, and if we, if we didn't have a system that was based on that, we're, we're creative, infinite beings. Like we can actually create a currency and a money that has value that does something life supporting. Like that is within the realm of possibility. And you could, you could do it, but here's your, here's the next task instantly that you've had the idea and you've got it all worked out in your head and you know what you want to do. You have to sell it to us because that's what a currency is. It's, it's confidence. Acceptance. It's acceptance, correct. Yeah. So you're going to have that same barrier to entry with your, your currency that has intrinsic value because we've got cur digital currency ideas that are going to be backed by diamonds. There's no intrinsic value in a diamond, but these people seem to think so. And so, yes, but they still have to sell that idea in the marketplace of human attention. And that's what, what it's come down to. In a digital world where we're all interconnected, we've transformed ourselves into a new kind of an organism. And we need to deal with the fact that we are collectively a new so kind of an organism. About, like transhumanism? No, 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 no. I'm talking about uh, something that I don't have a label for, okay? Transhumanism is trying to make a human into a robot, which I think is an absolute absurd idea and it's not going anywhere. All right. So what I think is the organism that we are? It's a collective. It's a true collective. It's not a Marxist collective. It's not a fascist collective. It's a collective of ideas. It's the attention marketplace. I can create a currency and I can give it value because I can get all of these people to pay attention to my ideas and to validate my ideas by their acceptance. And I can get confidence in that, that idea because of the value of the idea that I offer. And that's in comp direct competition with the Federal Reserve, which has their idea, their way of managing it. And we don't have any confidence in that crap anymore at all. And that's why we get change. We're at a huge point of, of flexing, of moving into a life-affirming world. And yes, there are aspects of it that feel dehumanizing, but they're far less dehumanizing, in my opinion, than the stuff that we've dealt with for the last 30 or 40 years and the direction that these bastards were trying to take us into. And they are collapsing and their ability to take us forward any longer, the cabal, the elite, et cetera, are, are dying off. They don't have the oomph anymore because it's all flattened out. And here's the whole thing. You'll see people that will 
say that, oh, well, this is an evil system and that the cryptos are not any better and that uh, it's a, a very nasty world. And like Catherine Austin Fitz has some good arguments, okay, mm -hmm. about, about all of this. But she, she misses and all these people forget to mention one thing. There's a no barrier to entry to learning to program. It's free to learn on the internet. The tools are available free. Therefore, anybody that wanted to disrupt the system is given the ability to do so with no barrier to entry. And it's totally egalitarian. Software can slug it out on the internet with other software. And so once they went into the software world, the elite made themselves vulnerable to wild ass people that, that came up with ideas like this. And so they failed just by making this available. If they'd never taken us onto the internet, I actually think the internet would have existed because of BBSs. I think they took us onto the internet because the BBS system was getting out of hand. Yep. They knew it because they were monitoring the phone lines. And so they figured they had to try and control it. And now it's gotten even worse. The Usenet groups. That was... <laughs> those were the days. Oh, those were the days. So are you saying... So basically, I think what I'm getting from what you're saying, Cliff, is that we're in this situation where what we have to do is sort of... I'm, it's difficult to find the right words. I think Danny and I are both very idealistic person people, and we sort of have this idea that we want our sort of spiritual evolution as humanity as humanity to you know involve having a financial system where um, th good ideas and hard work and creativity are valued more than the ability to hoard money or write code and things like that. But you're saying, in, and, I'm, and this is not saying that I that I agree one way or the other. What you're saying is that at this period of time, we sort of have to understand that this is something we have to do if, if, temporarily or maybe even on, for long term and sort of separate our spiritual evolution and go, I have to spend this percentage of my time dealing with the fact that this is how money works in the system we are right now and then go about the rest of our lives looking to find ways to, to kind of promote our more idealistic ways of life, of interacting with humans. Just, just as it is now, though. Right. Just as it's been for the, all of your lives. You've never had a money system you've trusted no. or understood or participated in. It was always controlled by others. And you spent all of your lives looking for some level of uh, personal fulfillment. Uh, uh, and, and you're saying significance. The, the, wrestling away, the wrestling away power from, you know, the evil fuckers is like the, that we have to like we have to wrestle that away first and then kind of worry about the other stuff later instead of trying to make the wrestling away of it part of the uh, creation of the idealist success. Like I, you, okay, you, I'm I, actually with you there. Okay. okay, you've just said it right there. Okay. No, and we're, we're not going to do that instead of. It, it is part of it. Okay. I'm one of these people that, okay, so, so I do Zen meditation. Yeah, no, I know I, you're a spiritual dude. I know. Yeah. Okay, no, no, but let me, let me, let me yeah. phrase this. Okay, Zen is clean. It's hard. It's the edge of the sword. Okay. It's not like a Vipassana, which is household meditation. I did that for like 20 years. Um, yeah, that's, that's a different kind of meditation, but the Zen meditation is extremely hard. It is the, probably the worst kind of thing you can ever put yourself through. And to do like a, an overnight kind of a Zen meditation session alters who you are. It actually does neurogenesis, creates new pathways. You get there, not because it's a, it's a nice, it is a life enhancing event but it is terrible it's painful it hurts it's difficult to get through it is one of the worst things you'll ever do and in my way of in and so from a male perspective okay from a male perspective that is p pristine it's clean it's the way i grow into life enhancement is through my suffering through that that pain and i know of no other way to grow and so so i think we are now growing the the system that danny would have exist but we're not there yet and to get there, we've got to go through all of this pain. And it's good because if you want, I'm not saying you have to, but if you want to, you could code and you could take on the best of them. All right. And so you could do this yourself. You don't have to be a money hoarder. You don't have to be evil. <clears throat> you can do things that are very life enhancing and very powerful. And cryptocurrencies opens up new avenues for that because it, it has at its core crowdsourcing. And so you can put your money where your idealism is and fund those companies that you think will make a difference on this planet. How does that have to do with recording transactions and hashing transactions? Like, what does one have to do with the other? Okay, these, these companies that are going to be changing, that are changing our reality now, are disintermediating, okay? They're decentralized companies. 
uh, they're taking the middleman out of the picture. Okay, okay. middleman just, you know, the guy who, who buys the wool from me and marks it up just to sell the same raw wool to a processor, and his only value added was that he walked across the room and, and sold it out another door. He's part of the middleman cadre that yeah. have been sucking the life out of us all of our lives. Banks, all of these individuals are all middlemen. Huge Banks, bonuses agents, and shit. all that kind of stuff, right? Correct. Yeah. Okay, so we're disintermediating. We're taking this whole layer out of society. So society is no longer going to be this huge pyramid where the guys on top make sure the guys immediately underneath them are, are kissing ass and sucking up because they've got control of the money tip, right? So what's going to happen is it's all flattening out peer to peer. And so it will be life enhancing because there won't be people stealing your life's work from you so in the form of, of your money. Nobody will be able to get rich doing nothing anymore. They're going to have to do something to get, okay. But how is it flattening out when you have more than half the world that doesn't have enough water, doesn't have enough food, is struggling, and we're using all this energy? But to we're using, our okay, but bear in mind now, the amount of energy we're actually using is relatively trivial, okay? It's, it's, the, it's less, we use electricity, okay, the amount of electricity that's going into all crypto mining right now is a small fraction. Let's just pick a number, one one hundredth of the amount of energy that was put into a single shuttle launch. <laughs> okay, see, so we've, we haven't done right. anything, right? <laughs> theoretical subtle, <laughs> subtle, subtle launch. Subtle launch. <laughs> it's theoretical. Or, okay, put it another way. Put it another way, you know, in the sense that look at how much of our money right now is maintaining the United States Pentagon, okay, right. in, yeah. in our yeah. army. Totally. But do you know that our army is mostly managers now? Yeah. <laughs> okay, so there's 88 managers for every company of fielded soldiers. 88 managers. That can actually outnumber the company repeatedly. Oh, and so if we can get rid of the mental managers throughout this whole thing and make everybody that much more productive, the system as a whole becomes productive. There's less strain on the planet. Everybody's life is enhanced and so on. Plus right now you can choose to take your dollars out of the dying system. You can go and buy some Ethereum or Bitcoin or whatever. And you can say, I like this company over here that's doing this project to get clean water to these people. And I can see how they're going to get a three or four or 5% return on the value that they're adding, getting clean water to these individuals. And I know that that return will come back to their coin. And over my lifetime, this will amount to something. The same way people used to say, I think it's worthwhile to put my money into General Electric because they're going to help electrify this nation. And I know that over time, the ability to have electricity in Tennessee and Oklahoma and all of this kind of stuff will add value to the whole system. And it will come back to me in the form of value in the shares that I bought in General Electric. It's no different than that. You're, you're right now at a cusp. As the old system is dying, you have the opportunity to segue yourself over before the giant stampede occurs. It will occur because, believe me, people will choose to go into the crypto system rather than go into the Mad Max world. And many of them will never conceive of it that way. They'll think of it in an entirely different way, and they'll move with the herd, so to speak, okay? And you can actually... There's videos out there where some of the top thinkers in cryptos who analyze, who are into analytics, analyze who, what's going on. They say the herd has turned. We're moving into it. That, you know, and I believe that as well. I think we're exiting the early adopter phase or the innovator phase and getting into early adopters. So in, in this country, way back when, when 3% of the American population at the time decided that there would be a revolution, it, it was so. And there was a revolution and we separated from England. All it took, we declared war, and only 3% of the population was in favor of that. And then it was 5%, and then it was 10%. And then the British did some really stupid things, and it was about 80%. And that's just the way it goes. And we're, we've passed that 3% threshold. So you get 3% of the population that's committed to an idea, and that idea persists over time. And look how many years we've been going, eight, nine years on this already. And so uh, it persists over time. You've got 3% of the population behind it. 10% will get behind us. And then you've got 13%. Another 20% will get behind them. And then you're almost to your halfway point. So it's going to happen extremely rapidly, just like with cell phones. You know, digital phones, are they a good idea or not? Well, no one's asking anymore. Yeah. At this point, the answer might be no, but, <laughs> but our lives are so intertwined. Uh, you know, in hindsight, yeah. 
<laughs> and I, you know, I, you know, at least once a week, I think, is this really a good idea? Maybe I should just turn this shit off and put it away. You know right, what I mean? right. Well, here's something to worry about, too. And, you know, on the, on the other part of it is that there are evil bastards out there using these computers to do things like trick dopamine responses out of you to keep you on their site longer. Yeah. And, you know, this kind of thing in order to get the attention. They're trying to game the individuals to get the attention. A lot of that goes away with the mechanisms that are inbuilt into some of these new tokens that are being offered. So, for instance, a lot of people have recognized that we're in an attention market world and that the way to get at that is to, to make our, our advertising a more uh, egalitarian system. So we're all, all familiar with the um, adpocalypse that went through YouTube where yeah. people lost lots, millions of dollars, right? Some people had been running companies that were taking in millions every month and they were reduced to poverty almost instantly. And that was done at the whim of a, of a few individuals uh, within the power structure. Well, with the new advertising vehicles that are coming on out that are blockchain based, you won't be able to do that. All the intermediaries are gone and it's the advertiser right to the person that has the advertising on their video or whatever. So it's a direct uh, transition. That's life enhancing, getting rid of all of these middle layers that just suck it out of us. So, you know, it's a, so it just depends on how you want to look at it. If you, if your only experience of it is through the coldness of the, of the computer screens, then I grant you, it's a tough sell. It's a hard thing to get your, your head wrapped around. Uh, but if you see it in, in its reality, in terms of the meetups and the, the using Bitcoin, I see the Bitcoins and the cryptos being used. I see people people go into the pot store. I see them use their Litecoin. They buy their cannabis and they, and they walk out. And so it's no different than using ferns, except that they're using something that is not centrally controlled and they're working against, in my mind, the evil bastards. Mm -hmm. Okay. And I just want to be clear because I, I looked it up while we were talking. Machine learning isn't a thing. It's not that computers are teaching themselves things that we're not tracking. You're saying that's not happening. Um, okay, so if we want to talk about it technically, here's the thing. Here's the idea. <clears throat> it's called a neural net. It has nothing to do with neurons, but it's little chunks of software code that replicate over hundreds of thousands of times. You write a little chunk of code that can differentiate between, say, three inputs, A, B, or C. And you replicate that code over and over and over again, and then you uh, let them connect on node C. And then you can pose a problem by programming these guys, and they can run through many different iterations of attempting to solve that program very fast. And they call that um, machine learning. Because once it's discovered the successful solution to the problem, then the software stops and it records that solution. The machine doesn't learn anything. The machine puts these solutions in the database. The success is, is based on a test. Does this, the solution we've come up with equal what was required in the equation? When it does, the software stops. So the, the, the machine has no concept of, of anything. It doesn't learn anything. So it's not we are, using, we are write, anthropomorphizing all of this. It's not going to be able to write a paper explaining what it did to you Correct. afterwards. It's just going to keep doing it over and over again, basically. Right. And so even machine learning is constrained by the software that's written and the, the constraints you put around it. And so AI is nothing to fear. It's something to be um, <clears throat> understood and used. And it, it's a very powerful tool. And, and it's like these tools right here and being able to do a four-way video conver a conversation and record it in real time and so on. Um, these, these tools are getting more sophisticated as software engineers, humans, <coughs> develop new attitude or new, new applications for them. So in that sense, it's um, machine learning. It, it's anthropomorphizing. We're using words we really shouldn't, you know? So is it, AI is not something that's ever really going to happen? We're never going to have a singularity? Here's the thing. Yeah, here's the thing. No, we're never going to have singularity. And the very first, you'll know uh, if I'm wrong, because you'll have a computer programmer stand up somewhere and shout to the top of the world that they've gotten consciousness connected to software and they want their goddamn Nobel Prize right now. It's, it would be so powerful to be able to connect consciousness, sentiency in any way, shape, or form to software that it would not be a secret. You would hear about it everywhere because this, that would be a genius thing to be able to do that, and it would be worth bazillions and bazillions of dollars. AI, as we understand it, is a computer that is running in software that's constrained by the software, making choosing between millions of things based on our inputs and the other inputs that may be coming into its limited sensory array that we built. And is and there a constraint around this? Is this like a, a perspective that other people might not agree? Or is this sort of like consensus in the computer realm that 
there's well, no- yeah, we, we write the software. Yeah, there's nobody that's ever connected consciousness to computers in any way, shape, or form. Mm-hmm. Okay, it's just simply not possible. And here's, here's the thing. I know this, and, here's, here, and this is actually a life-enhancing thing. I know that this is the case because there's no self for a computer to become aware of. All right? We all have a self. We know that this self exists, and we can prove it to ourselves by just a little bit of a thought experiment. And that is that when you go to bed at night and you uh, go to sleep, you're not conscious. You are not aware of what's going on in your body. Your, your, your body continues to function. And in that way, it's somewhat like the computer. If you just leave the electricity on, it sits there and waits for you to do something. And so it continues to function overnight. But there's a big difference here. Because when we go to sleep, our consciousness actually departs from uh, most of our minds and leaves only a little bit of residence there to keep the body itself functioning. And when it comes back to our body in the morning, we feel ourselves. We feel exactly as we were when we went to sleep. We feel ourselves come back after we've been knocked out. Okay? And we come back into our minds. We come back into regular cognition. And we have a feeling of ourselves. And we know it's not somebody else. I know when I wake up in the morning that I'm not Randy. You know, I mean, it's just not possible, right? <laughs> I've woken up a few mornings and wondered if I was really Randy. <laughs> <laughs> and that has to do with something else entirely. But, <laughs> but so, so there's no self for a computer to become aware of. And you need the self in order to be self-aware. Now, there are those individuals that are, that are trapped in the idea, in the way of thinking. And this is where the idea of the singularity comes up with, uh, what's his name, Kurzweil, right? Yeah. And those kind of guys. They are, they are trapped into the idea that we are our bodies, all right? That the consciousness that we have will, will cease to be when our bodies die. And therefore, they, they are of the opinion that, well, if we can just get enough chips into a computer, we can reach some critical threshold, and it will become self-aware as we are, because we're just dumb meat computers. And so it is their concept of who we are as humans, their limited understanding of what it is to be human, that allows them to think that a singularity, transhumanism, could ever happen. And so they're wrong, 100% wrong. But and, couldn't a computer, while not recognizing an actual self, recognizing an other, something that isn't it? Do you know no, what I'm- no, because it can't recognize anything. The software can react to images that I allow to come through a video camera by software I write, and then I write software to react to the images that come on in as best I can as a, as a writer of software. But if I don't write it in there, the computer can't recognize anything. It can make no decisions. Decisions actually come from hormones. Our human body is very interesting, all right? We actually have three minds operating simultaneously most of our lives. We have a body mind, we have a feeling mind, and we have a, a, a desire mind. You will note, as women, that what I'm about to tell you is accurate, okay? Most of the time, most women are in feeling mind. And most of the time, most men are in desire mind. (laughs) Correct? Okay, now we can extrapolate from that understanding. And we can say feeling mind is related to nerves. Most women are sensory uh, perceptive. Most of the time, their life is spent in their nerve structure. And if we were to strip away the flesh and just leave the nerves, that would be a much more accurate representation of a woman's mind than the flesh itself. Whereas in men, it's in the blood. Most men, you know, they're hot blooded, you know, when you get into uh, men or it can be passionate, but it always comes back to the blood aspect of things. And so this is the tie where our consciousness ties in to our physical bodies. And so we actually have these three minds. You know, you're in body mind. Body mind is very limited. It's the amount of mind that we use to run our meat robots. Okay. But it is not our consciousness. It is not us in totality. It is simply that part of our mind that, con- that, that controls the meat sack that is us housing our consciousness. And we are all conscious. And we know that when we go to sleep at night and come back in the, ne- in the next morning, when we wake up, we are conscious again of ourselves as ourselves within our body. And, but you can get yourself into your body mind if you're wounded. Because instantly you're, you're in shock. And when we say you're going into shock, there's a period of time when you are all body mind. All you can think about is the wound itself, you know, the blood gushing out, all of the pain, et cetera, right? 
And so, but in the process of that, if you go far enough and your body thinks it's going to die, it'll flip you into desire mind or feeling mind. And so, and probably back and forth very rapidly, depending on what's going on in your, in your pancreas and liver and so on. And what it does there is that it gets you into the idea of, oh, hey, I love everybody. I've got to, exp- I've got to live to express my, my love to these people I've never said this to. And that's really what you think. Sometimes you might get people that, oh, I hate those guys. I've got to, got to you know, live long enough to you know, get that hate out and beat them up. But very rarely. I've actually seen a couple of people die that way, and it was very ugly. But they were that, that way in life. Most people express love. Or they express desire in the sense that, hey, I never got to do this. I've got to live long enough to, you know, to, to take a wingsuit and jump off of Everest or something. You know, some, whatever it is was their desire. And so these are what get you out of body mind. And in the transition from those three, you can actually feel the, the difference. I've been wounded enough. I can tell you that this is indeed a truism. And so the thing is that with computers, they don't have, they, they don't even really have body mind because they don't have a body. What allows us to have body-mind is the nerves, the blood system, and those two are tied together by the vagus nerve. And the vagus nerve is very interesting because it ties together all of our major systems from your brain, through the glands in your throat, down into your respiration, into your heart, into your spleen, into your liver, into your gallbladder, and into your intestines, and all the way on down to your anus. And so the vagus nerve ties you all together that way, except there's one major part of your body it doesn't touch. That's the adrenals. That's because that's your fail-safe system, right? And it's got to kick in the adrenals if, in that life support last ditch kind of a thing. But absent that, the vagus nerve ties everything together. And it is through that system that consciousness is able to get at and control and deal with the body-mind. And in general, when I'm sleeping and I'm not paying attention with my breathing, my breathing keeps going because body-mind is there doing it because of the connection that consciousness keeps through the vagus nerve. And it's always been my joke that they're going to come along, the transhumanists, and they're going to like Kurzweil or somebody, and they're going to, well, you know, I'm dying. I need a new body. Let's transplant my head, right? And I'll still be the same rich guy. I'll still own all of this, and I'll I'll, I'll get this big body, and everything will be great, right? And so they do that. They chop the guy's head off, and they chop the guy's head off on the other fellow, and they stitch them together, and everything's fine, and they give them the jolt of electricity, and they come back together. And it's like, and then the, the guy in Kurzweil's voice says, oops. I'm the other guy. Turns out consciousness is actually attached to the pancreas. <laughs> and that's a truism as well. Consciousness does originate with the pancreas, all right, from that system. And so it's not in your brain. And your brain is just a cranium that holds your four sensory organs and an emulsified oil base of, of crystals that are your connection to your thoughts. That emulsified oil base is what we call our brain. And those crystals align to pick up thoughts. You don't actually house thoughts in your body the way a computer houses software on its disk. It doesn't occur. There's a a much more ephemeral, much more interesting connection between our brains and our thoughts and our memories. And so our memories are, quote, out there. They exist in consciousness totally. And so this is why I know what I'm saying is, is factual. How do you know that consciousness exists in the pancreas? Um... A couple of, um, a a number of experiences, both under psychedelics and without, okay? So in in meditation, there's a particular kind of meditation that is done when you're doing Zen that allows you to do deep control of the vagus nerve. It's nothing you can do uh, that you should do unless you've been trained and unless you've had someone there uh, to watch you and know what's going on. You'll notice in some of the overnight Zen things, they've got this guy walking around with a stick and he walks you on the shoulders and stuff. He's, he's there and more as a, a, it's, a lot of people say, well, it's to get you to come back to the attention, to the ever-present now. Uh, but really, he's also there in case in your deep meditation, you're able to trigger some of these responses that you should not. And the Tao was to have this saying, and Zen meditation comes from Chan, C-H-A-N, Chan meditation, which was the Taoist form, right? And there's this saying in the old Taoist thing that originated before what's known as the Five Bushels League, which was the first uh, attempt to provide health care. Uh, but uh, years, you know, thousands of years ago, and they said, we owe everything we know to the 10,000 who died. And there were 10,000 meditators over time who got to specific points in the meditation and ended up killing themselves because of manipulation of the vagus nerve in the attempt to find the, the seat of consciousness. Was it in the Dandian? Was it in the Hara? The, the, 
core thing in the chakra system up above the muladhara, or was it over here in the spleen? And eventually they were able to locate it down to the pancreas. And even at today, um, modern medicine does not understand the pancreas at all. And, and they think they do, and they talk about the hormones it produces and so on, but you have to also understand all of our actions are all related to hormones. We don't make a decision without uh, hormones. And so that's what makes our meat sack make a decision with our brains. And computers can't make a decision because they don't have hormones and can't react to it. And so again, I know AI doesn't exist because we do exist the way we are. And I also know that Borg and that kind of thing, uh, you could control someone. You could put a machine together that would pump hormones into them. They wouldn't last very long because it would throw the whole system out of homeostasis. But um, that would be about as close as you could get to to some kind of AI infusion into a human being. See, my argument all along has been largely that the concomitant to that isn't so much that the machines evolve to a human point, but the humans themselves are devolved as a result of interacting with binary systems, whereas the human itself becomes less human as a result of integrating with the machines. You see a lot of that in the anime and a lot of that in some of the French uh, movies and so on. Yeah, yeah. And there's a, there's a, we sit here and we are proof that that is not happening. The reason we're proof that it's not happening is because that is the idea of that we would devolve or become simplified. And in fact, we're becoming more complex by the day, by the minute, by the hour, complexity increases in our universe. And as complexity increases, it takes us and provides more opportunities and so on. And some of those opportunities, in this case, transhumanism, would seem very negative and, and that kind of thing. But within the attention market space, they may exist for a while, and then they'll fade off because they don't have any long sustaining value. Okay. All right. But uh, the complexity thing, too, by the way, just yeah. before we, we finish on that. Um, my, my framework comes from the meditation, uh, from uh, reading a lot over the years, and from uh, psychedelic drugs and speaking with other, other mind, not my own. And my perspective is that we are energy beings, and that we exist 22 trillion times a second, my body exists, and 22 trillion times a second, it does not exist. And so as an energy Great. being, yeah. okay, uh, I'm flashing in it. Goes back to we little bloop, in, little bloop right? Yeah. Little, little bloop, bloop theory. theory, right? All right. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And so the little bloop theory is that the the energy keeps crossing over itself until it becomes so complex and so dense it creates matter, and it does this twenty two trillion times a second as consciousness flows through. Consciousness is that pulse. We swim in a sea of consciousness. We just can't see it because we are there participating in it the same way a fish can't see water, and consciousness exists all over us. And it, and it exists, used to exist in a, in a pretty much equal fashion around the planet, more or less. You know, there are some areas where you could go and people would say, oh, don't you feel the vibes here? It's just great. It feels great to be this area. And you couldn't put it down to like, you know, negative ions or something like that. It actually was some kind of a, a different feeling. And so maybe consciousness was more dense there. But, com but quantum computers exist because what they're able to do is to take a computer chip and put it into a can from which they've extracted all the consciousness as much as they possibly can, as much as possible to remove from there. And, that's, and then they do the computer zapping uh, uh, metaphorically of the steel plate and the wait annealing. for the answer to right. appear, right? And, but the only way that that can happen is if we don't think about the steel plate while it's occurring because our consciousness would intrude on it. And so the way that they do that is they suck out all the air out of a can. They put mm -hmm. the computer chip in there. They suck all the air out. They suck all the heat out of it. It's super, super, super cooled. It's isolated by all these uh, insulators. And then they basically have it such that people can't, can't disturb it with their consciousness. Well, because we are as we are, and the world is ever so much more complex now than it was when I was born, I'm able to say with certainty that the energy thing that is in the little bloop theory, the consciousness, is creating more complexity as we go forward, not less. And so transhumanism, transhumanism is less complex than a regular human, because as a regular organic human, I'm not constrained by software. Any kind of a machine introduction to a human has got to be dealt with at some level by software, which introduces a level of constraint. And so it, it, it's a reducing kind of a deal. And the universe is not supporting of that. It's actually supporting us being more expansive, doing uh, more and more things. True, we're having to deal with a lot of them as digital. But, you know, quantum computers are all analog. 
They just have a digital interface to go to a computer screen, but they're 100% analog. And so this is gonna, it takes a lot of people really a difficult time to wrap their head around. That's interesting. I didn't know that. That's, that's very interesting, actually. So, okay. Yeah, wow. I, I know this, by the way, because I'm on some of the software development teams that are writing compilers. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, and I'm in a very peripheral fashion for what the quantum, quantum computers. What are computers used for? Okay, so here's the problem. 3%, uh, 4% of the entire internet is indexed by Google. Only three or four percent. Ninety ninety-six percent of the internet, Google does not index, doesn't even know it exists. That's what we call the dark web. Okay. It's that area of the internet that's unindexed. But even with only three or four percent that Google indexes, to find something in that huge amount of terabytes of data takes forever with their servers. Massive, huge amounts of stuff. So if if they want to find a specific record in everything that Google is indexed, uh, it, they might start looking now and it might come up with that record three weeks from now. That's how much stuff they've got to go through. So the, the options for them are more and more and more and more servers, splitting the task up, paralyzing it, all these fancy algorithms to split the search thing into, into fobbing it off on all these machines to try and make it happen in sort of near real time. And also the other thing that, that they do is they restrict what they actually look at and bring back to you. So if you actually were to ask Google how many websites had by count, an actual count of how many websites had this particular attribute, uh, you know, you could pick something. I don't, you know, how many uh, use JavaScript. doesn't matter what it is. It would be, so, the number would be so large, it would take them days, weeks to actually calculate that. So quantum computers are using this 80-20% rule in an analog computing fashion to guess at the answer. And 80% of the time, they're reasonably accurate. Not accurate, reasonably accurate. They come really close to that number because the numbers we're dealing with are really, really, really huge. This is important because we're about to enter into a phase in human technology where we're gonna start monkeying about with what I call and what the Zen people would understand in the Taoist. It's called the ever-present now or this moment or you know, zero point, whatever you wanna think about, yeah. right? Okay, we're about to monkey with that. When you do that, you're dealing with things that are done in, a, in this language called calculus, which has, is a language that expresses really big numbers that arithmetic just doesn't do. You can't say it's you know a billion or a trillion or a quadrillion. It's a number so far bigger than that that you have to have a word for it that we don't even know yet, that kind of thing. Really big numbers that are required to mess about with the ever-present now and cause things to occur. <clears throat> so that's what they're going to use quantum computers for, is to calculate the kind of stuff that they need to know at CERN before they pop off that next little um, um, particle, particle that doesn't really exist. It's just energy that they've redirected around to try and do things with other energy to create a particular kind of a plasma yeah. that runs across the toroid in order to affect the ever-present now. So, yeah, you're not going to crack the lotto with your, with your quantum computer, right? <laughs> But it's also, look, it's, my big thing was we, we don't need to be afraid of it, you know. It, it can feel cold, it can feel weird, and so on. But all of this shit come out of people's heads. And, and if one human thought about it, you can think about it the same way and learn to understand what it is they were thinking. <laughs> Thanks for being such a gentle, compassionate teacher, Cliff. Yeah. <laughs> well, I've suffered a lot. <laughs> <laughs> Well, yeah, I think there's, I, I'm going to have to reflect on all the things we've spoken about here, but yeah, I mean, that was like a lot of, thank you for that. I mean, it's, yeah. uh, it makes oh, the I know. Playback. The, yeah. You, you do the playback. Uh, yeah. Which I think we will facilitate rapidly since we're going to rapid production now. So uh, we get, we're trying to get shows out much faster. And I think this is timely. Um, did, did we've gone around enough? Uh, did we, exhaust satisfy in some way mitigate some of the angst have we I, I look i staked out a harsh position for myself because in the background i really first off i love technology secondly i hate the new world order and thirdly i'd really like at some point in my life to extricate myself from this money system because i'm on a treadmill too 
But critically, I have examined and kind of conveyed a great deal of angst and, and crabbiness and general curmudgeon oh. behavior. And we love publicly, it. <laughs> largely to do this whole plunger effect to kind of swirl all the shit up and see where it lands because I see people were confused. I see there's fears. I have some of those fears. I express some of those fears. Some of those fears are mystical. They're kind of linked to this pure sense that we can somehow merge into this pool of celestial fuzziness and be done with all this bullshit, but it's not going to work. We're still in physicality. So for me, Damn. This, was, this was kind of, kind of like, you know, Damn. I, I'm, I'm neutral to that degree. And at the same time, I've been very hostile to cryptos. It's so, a big, it's a big change though. You know, uh, yeah, it is. you know, you, you, uh, I had this interview with, uh, Carrie Cassidy. Um, I should not have done it. I resisted it. I, I, <laughs> well, I knew, you were wondering what you were thinking, Blake. Oh, okay, yes. well, here's, here's exactly, here's exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> I thought about it in a Zen fashion. I wanted to know, was I resisting because it was something I should have done, something that I should have addressed in myself, right? Was, yeah. it, was I resistant because of something internal to me? And that turned out not to be the case. I was resistant because it put, and I told her ahead of time, people don't know the backstory. For weeks, weeks, she had tried to arrange this. And uh, she'd tried it with Bix Weir and myself, and that didn't work. Bix had interviewed with her, and never again, he said. <coughs> finally, finally, I said, okay. Um, you know, I had to tell her, we don't share the same understanding of things. And I was, was very factual with her, saying, I'm not going to sit here and let you state things as a fact that I find to be not a fact or that I can refute. I will state that I can refute them. And so I was, I was resistant that way. But I never should have done it because here's the situation. I was attacking her paradigm. Yep. I didn't recognize that she was so invested in that paradigm that she would respond emotionally. I should have. I should have been a little bit more gentle with her and with myself and realized that she was defending the paradigm and she would have to defend it because it was part of her matrix of the worldview. We are all like that. And so we'll all defend ideas as though our lives are dependent upon it, even to ourselves yeah. as we contemplate whether we should yeah. do something. Is this a good idea? Is this a bad idea? And usually you get rightness and reason. These are two other minds that you have. Rarely are they in attendance. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Rarely are they in attendance. But sometimes you'll get a feeling and you'll just get that feeling and it's working through your body mind. And it's rightness and reason telling desire mind and feeling mind through the body. You know, maybe you get uh, chills or something like that. Whatever is your body clue. You know, some people, they scratch their hand when they know they're making a good money decision and they can't help it, right? That yeah. kind of thing. Yeah. And so their body is telling them through their mind that this is the way to go. And so, but to get to that point to where you're actually open to rightness and reason and allow that to come on through, you have to go through that layer of, it's easier not to, the path of least resistance. I have a paradigm investment in it. And uh, most people are, uh, I'm, I'm fortunate because my mind is somewhat twisted, okay? I'm fortunate in the sense that I'm able to take an idea, put it into my paradigm, and examine to see whether it fits. And it doesn't bother my paradigm to put it in there and take it out. I don't care, right? Other people are not like that, and Carrie is not like that. Yeah. So when I, when I assaulted her I, understanding of AI, it set off uh, the reaction that we saw. And, and I felt very bad about that. Well, and, and in all fairness, there's a lot of us, and I include myself in it, who have really tossed this term around in ways that have, it's, I've used the term AI in reference to what we would call non-human intelligence, which is a completely different thing. But we've aggregated so much of our terminology, and AI is a catchy term. You know, if, I, cool. throw in a, <laughs> if I throw it in a YouTube, I guarantee oh, yeah. it, it gleans a few, not that I make any money from YouTube, but I like the numbers. I'm like, I'm not like everybody else. Yeah. You know, I, Dope, I, dopamine response. Exactly. Yeah. And we do that to ourselves too. So, you know, watching not only other people, but even myself on the stage and going, 
our precision and terminology sucks. We're not communicating clearly. We are probably creating a huge amount of fear in the active subconscious of a certain, a certain segment of the populace, if not generally, because most people are religious. Most people have been conditioned into the paradigm structure of good, evil, Satan, you know, the whole thing. Authoritarianism. And, right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. basically. Yeah. Yeah. And, and, authoritarianism, all that. Yeah. And I'm yeah. no different than that. I still have that vestige vestigially embedded in my own consciousness. And I'm saying this now to be transparent because when I was listening to you talk, I was feeding back to myself and going, you know, I, I, I see where I've been reactionary. That said, I'm not utterly thrilled about the fact that we have to interact with digital in order to get to a place where we create what I consider consider to be a better organic experience maybe that kind of bounces off of some yeah. things that danny was expressing that was a good and you know there's there's the rub dude the the programmers that are out working on the real ai of the moment these expert systems i know what you're going to say they're attempting to take that away they're attempting to make danny feel good about it because they're going to put the warm and fuzzy face on it by making it more human in the sense of their response because really that's all they're doing is engineering a computer response, the software response back to the human, and they want the human to feel more comfortable. And you know, the holy grail is to be um, able to express to a co in a computer software emotion. Very, very difficult. Computers don't understand anything. There's no thought there. So try and get a computer software to react to the difference in the emotional uh, tonality that we find in words. That's what I've been spending the last 20 years on is refining my emotional reduction engine. So I can look at linguistics and know some of the emotions that are behind it. Some, some small little fraction, maybe 2%, maybe 3%. But even that would be valuable putting it into the computer programs because they would know the software would be able to react to a hesitancy, a change in the, in the linguistics being there and come up with more reassuring words and so on. And it's not um, evil. It's an attempt to interact, uh, to make the, as a designer of it, to make the digital uh, interaction more pleasant to a human. That's why a lot of guys think robots will do, that you'll be much more comfortable talking to an Android than you would be dealing with the typing and this kind of thing. I think they may be a little bit misplaced. Maybe they're a little early. You know, we just don't know, right? But we are certainly moving in, in the George, what I think of as the George Jetson sci-fi world. And that's, that's coming around us, you know, flying cars and all of this and the, my dog Astro and all of that, right? And so we're, we're going to go to that world. And in that world, AI artificial intelligence is an attempt by software to mitigate out what we find as humans to be disturbing with this constant. About, yeah. Right. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's why we're not typing on green screen terminals, like in Brazil, the, the movie, you ever see that? Yeah. Yeah. You know? And so, so we've got gorgeous, you know, full videos, colors, trying to get the more colors and better screens and all of this kind of thing. And true. There are people that are gaming that, at a corporate level within the evil old system to get a dopamine response to keep yeah. you on Twitter or, or Facebook longer and that kind of thing so that they gain more of your attention so they can sell it to advertisers, et cetera. But that world's going away. We're becoming much more sophisticated and getting out of it. Now, there's one other aspect of this too. I understand your reluctance. I understand the, the problems with cryptos from a non-programmer's viewpoint. And uh, I come back to the basically the pirate model of, of the planet. And that is that uh, software is the ultimate pirate playground. And any of us can become a pirate within that world. And so I actually know it's better to cooperate with a lot of other people and work towards a collective common good. As a pirate, my life would be a lot easier in doing so if I'm, you know, a pirate against the large system as a whole and I'm not out pirating on any individual. And software is an egalitarian tool, and it's becoming ever so much more so as these libraries and stuff build up behind us as we go forward. So you need no less now in terms of the technical aspect to do more programming and get more oomph out of your, your software and your computers. And then to Danny's uh, view of the world, uh, I, I w the one thing that we really need to take away from is that we sit at a very unique point in history. And so here we have 
people like ourselves who will make great fortunes without being involved in great crimes. So everybody on the planet that has a lot of wealth right at this moment, you name somebody that we all know and hate, right? Queen of England, George Soros, any of these people, all of their great wealth begins with a great crime, just like in Godfather. You know, he kills the guy, takes the, the shopping cart or the cart full of veggies, and that's the start of their, their empire. <clears throat> now we don't have to do that. You can actually add value to universe and be rewarded for adding value to universe in any number of ways within the crypto system without any great crime being involved. A whole new class of elite that is not trained in the schools of the elite, doesn't think like them, hasn't been vetted that they're for sure a psychopath. None of these things are required and you can become quite wealthy. How and is thus, people adding value though? Sorry, I know I've asked the question 9,000 times because it goes back to being binary. <clears throat> Either you're a criminal or you're crypto and it doesn't take into account like maybe you make something wonderful. You know, like all right, sure, sure. And I'm and if you make something wonderful or you're a great musician or something, then sell your services for cryptos. Don't take the criminals' paper money. That's as easy as it as it gets. That's as simple as it gets for all uh, taking value in universe. And, and you just, so you Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. Well, just going back to the the comparison you just made, you said you could get rich by adding value, and that's oh, okay. Not. All right, here's here's what I was gonna say. All right. You can add value because right now the system is dying. The new system needs funding. And so here you are, you may have a few of the Federal Reserve notes that they've been uh, putting out over the years. You may have accumulated a little bit. You may be a saver. You can take your savings and you can do yourself some good and the planet some good by examining carefully the offerings that are in crypto space and then choosing to invest some of your money in some of them. All right. And I say examine them carefully because it's a wild, wild west out there. There's a lot of scammers. There's a lot of banditos everywhere. And you've got to make sure you know what you're doing because no one's going to safeguard you. If you send your cryptos off to an address that is bogus, doesn't exist or whatever, they're gone. And so you really need to double check and make sure you know what you're doing on this. However, right now, you could maybe be part of a tipping point, a crowdsource, if you will, right? Somebody's got a good idea. They need funding. You take a little bit of your savings, you buy some Ether or some Bitcoin, and you invest it in their company. And then just the way you would have bought shares 20, 30, 40, 50 years ago and had it grow over time, maybe you pick five companies and maybe four of them crap out. But maybe that fifth one has a really good idea and it makes more than enough money for all of the others crapping out. And you've added value because you've supported people that have a good idea that provides clean water or organic food. I know of one company that's setting up a crypto uh, blockchain now in a cryptocurrency. And their goal is to make it so that farmers who are little tiny guys can sell organic food to restaurants legally. Because now many jurisdiction, jurisdictions you're not allowed to sell unless you've been vetted that you're organic and they can track each each. A seed goes to this plant and this tomato comes out and so on and they can track it all the way back. And so this company is coming out with a mechanism that allows the, the small farmer to do this at an extremely low cost. And this company needs funding. This company is running on a blockchain. They're doing an ICO and they're just one of hundreds. Now, right at the minute, at the moment, there's maybe 2,500 companies that are seeking funding this way because they can't get through banks. Banks are not lending. And so the whole system is crashing because the credit system is dying and it's no longer supporting the system as it, as it used to be. When it was first set up in the 1900s, if you put your money into Ford, they used that money to buy new machine tools to make new cars. Okay, but as the system evolved, you were, you were basically in a casino. The money was never actually going to Ford, the company to buy new machine tools to make new cars. It was in trapped in this financial layer and it was going to the bonuses of all these bankers and that kind of thing. By opting out of that system and supporting some of these companies directly, you're participating in a new, new form of uh, energy exchange here that is to your benefit because here's the thing. Say that you, you put your money into a company and the company uh, doesn't, hasn't even launched a product yet, but you feel for whatever reason a month later or two months later that you want to put your money elsewhere. Because the nature of the markets we're dealing with are, are so liquid, you'll be able to sell your, your token, your investment in that company, and transfer it elsewhere. And maybe you'll regret that when the company finally brings out their product and it goes, and the value of that uh, token that you had had has gone through the roof. Or maybe you'll be correct and this company will crap out. 
a lot of the companies are going to fail because that's just the nature of a lot of companies. But we can pick good ones and we can be part of those Bitcoin millionaires. And I bet you none of the Bitcoin millionaires are selling off their Bitcoin for fiat because the fiat's being, you know, why would anybody save paper or digital dollars? Because they're losing their, their purchasing value. They can be infinitely created. They go to support the criminal system and so on and so on. You can't find any real good reason to support the dollar except you can pay your taxes with it. Well, at the end of the year, you can sell your cryptos to pay your taxes, right? And that's, so we'll have a vehicle for that. And at some point, the, the government will come, probably come out with a tax coin. And they'll only accept that for, for your taxes. And at the end of the year, you'll have to buy some. But if you bought some earlier in the, in the year, you know, they would have been cheaper. And so there will be a market because real market behavior, price discovery is occurring. That doesn't happen in the stock market. It's a, it's a casino, you know? So, so we're in an entirely different world here. And we can do good and at the same time do good for ourselves as we go along. It is an opportunity. And we also have to acknowledge that there's a huge mass of giant debt, quadrillions in derivatives. All of this debt represents wealth. It represents antiques, buildings, you know, places, businesses, all kinds of stuff that have been enwrapped in the debt system. As the debt system is dying conceptually, that wealth has to be transferred out. It's got to go somewhere. We used to think maybe it would go into gold and silver, but gold and silver won't work in our modern world. So all that wealth is going into the cryptocurrencies. And so we, as small individuals that don't own any of this great wealth, can still participate because it's all got to rush in through a very small gateway, which is the current number of cryptos and tokens and so on that exist. And I know it will grow because it can grow to expand to the crypto world can grow to expand to fill all of the debt world to suck out that whole balloon full of wealth and make it productive and put it into a, a more harmonious planet so okay so you mentioned a little bit back that it's the wild west out there and to be careful and whatnot what is a good place for someone like myself who has not entered into the bitcoin thing at all to begin like, where is a good place for me to begin educating myself so that i make wise decisions if I'm, if I decide I want to start experimenting with Bitcoin, where does a person like myself start? Uh, it's all free to learn. Uh, you can go to YouTube, you can go to right. Reddit, you can go to uh, GitHub, you can go to Slack. You can just basically put in the label of a, of a name of a coin that you might be interested in and, right. and learn to do this kind of thing. Now here's a caution. There are people on YouTube that are selling coins and they'll use lots of emotional language to try and get you whipped up. So if you hear that stuff, if you feel yourself becoming emotionally whipped up, back off and say, hmm, because there may, there's a lot of scams out there, right? So there's a lot of people saying passive income, 1% per month and all of this kind of stuff. And they're, they're Ponzi schemes. They're trying to take advantage of you and get, hook you on the greed and that sort of thing. So you, so you have to be an adult about this and use a rational mind to analyze it. And so the thing to do is to uh, so there's a, would be a couple of ways to go. I can't give financial advice because right. I'll get yeah. sued, right? But yeah. there's a couple of ways conceptually to go. One way would be to just buy the coins, Bitcoin, Litecoin, uh, those things that are actually currencies, or Ethereum, which is a network that right. the Ethereum token has value because when a company comes up with an idea to run on their network, they need to use Ethereum to, to, as the rite of passage on that network. And so the Ethereum value goes up over time. So you could buy those. They're going to appreciate over time because they're the gateway. They're sort of the gateway drug into our new world, right? What, not, what, what's the say? Like, but for someone like me, like I feel like an idiot asking this, but I'm sure there's a million other idiots like me out there. Like, what's the safe way to go buy Bitcoin? How do I do that? How do I know? Oh, sure. I oh, okay. Bitcoin? In the United States, here you'd set up a Coinbase account. Okay, okay. So that's the way. Okay. Right. Yeah. yeah. And if you want to learn about okay. this in yeah. terms yeah. of a, okay, that's of what a I thought, but I was, yeah. Right. Oh, okay. And see, it depends on where you're at. In Washington state, we can't use Coinbase anymore because our state government has gotten so snooty about making them tell about all of the customers they're dealing with that they said, screw you. Okay. So we're just not going to do business in Washington state anymore because of the reporting uh, problems, not because of criminality or anything. So, right. but if you want to learn about this, there's this guy, uh, he has a YouTube channel, J Snip. Jay Snip yeah, Ford. I've seen your videos with him before. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, and he does. He's got some videos out there. Getting started in cryptocurrencies. He takes okay. you through how to get a wallet, how to set up an account on these exchanges, how to how to connect it to your bank account, how to to buy some of them, how to store them, get them off the exchanges. Okay, if you bought a chunk of a Bitcoin, if you bought some Ethereum or stuff on Coinbase, send it to your wallet on your PC, back it up, print it out, and you're good, right? 
then this way it's, it's very much like gold and silver. If you don't hold it, if it's not on your PC, you're not in control of it. And so okay. you need to be aware of that. Okay. And so, but so other it's important than to have it in your wallet and not just leave it on the coin, the exchange. Correct. Like, correct. You want to buy it, put it in your wallet later, go back, buy more, put it in your wallet. Right. Okay. And then you can, then there's also things that are not centralized exchanges now, peer to peer trading. Okay. Things like ether Delta and then many other different words you'll hear that make no sense to you at all. Uh, you know, bit hit and a few of these others, there, there are things that are decentralized exchange, peer to peer trading, and there are the wild west. And there are people out there trying to manipulate them. So they'll go on out and they'll sell a bit of a Bitcoin for less than the going rate. And then they'll sell another bit of a Bitcoin for less than going rate, trying to drive the price down so they can come in and buy a bunch if people panic. And mm -hmm. so you got to be aware of this. It's, it's, it's like even worse than the wild west. It's like the early days of the stock market with the Rockefellers out there and the, you know, these people trying to manipulate yeah. the hell out yeah. of the common person. It doesn't work that well so, so much on these distributed exchanges because it's not one person against a mass. It's peer to peer trades. And so even if they've got robots and so on, they're still trying to deal with themselves against some, any, uh, some single individual. And so it flattens it out again and makes it much more egalitarian. And so you, you, you can buy and sell on these distributed exchanges. JSNP, Joe has got some, some videos on how okay. to do that. But there's hundreds of other people doing this okay. as well. I, I, you know, I just, I wanted, I just wanted a suggestion as to where to go that had reliable, good information. And so Jason, I've seen his videos before, so I'll go check out his. Okay, yeah. very good. Thanks for uh, tolerating my. <laughs> no, that's right. No, 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 no. You yeah. see, it's, it's best that we all understand where we're at here and treat this as adults. So I'm quite happy to always answer questions about that, uh, even if I've done it before. In fact, yeah. maybe I get better at it as I go along. I think this was actually like a really, you know, obviously we're, we're here at two and a half hours and we haven't gotten to time. So I have a feeling that's going to have to put off. I think we've run yeah. out of time for time. Yeah, yeah I think so but, too. Yeah. But, it's yeah. too bad too. I got all these no, no. notes. But yeah, well, here's the thing. I don't, I don't want anybody going away disappointed. Um, this was important. I think this was a good conversation. I, my original plan was yeah. to, do, to rip this segment off of the main show and put it out standalone. And we're going to stay with that. Let's reschedule. Let's give time its due consideration and the amount of time that it takes to talk about time. So that <laughs> now we've talked about money and we can come back and we can talk about time because I personally don't want anybody walking away with, um, you know, temporal blue balls tonight. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. There you go. But too late, Randy. You and I always have temporal I know, I know. <laughs> we leave ever frustrated. Yeah. I got to say right. this. I really enjoyed this. We had two people with us tonight, uh, Danny Katz and Cliff High, both of whom are extremely gifted in linguistics and the use of language and the monitoring of language. In very different ways, yeah. In very different ways, tracking consciousness this is an evolving conversation that we're having. We're the front line right now for vetting this information. Cliff, I can't thank you enough. You're tireless. You've been a champion for this. You uh, suffer the slings and arrows for your work, but this is important stuff. We're really at a critical, yeah. critical juncture in human history. And that's how I see it, that yeah. we're right there. This is the weird front lines. It's, you know, to the barricades and damn, if it isn't in front of a computer screen. <laughs> that's right. Yeah. All right. But I very much enjoyed talking to Danny. She's got some just really sharp perspectives here. And I'm sure she speaks for so many of the early adopters yeah. who are basically saying, what the hell? <laughs> yeah. yeah. Uh, I th th thank you to all three of you, you guys. I'm, 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 I feel blessed and honored to have such intelligent yeah, friends. And um, I, we can do this again and again over the years on whatever issues come up, because I do see people like us as being super important in making sure that this, that this potential with these kinds of things like cryptocurrency or whatever other ideas may come along, go in the right direction. And it's yeah. these kinds of conversations between people like us that will help keep it that way. So. And of course, for you out there, uh, your comments will undoubtedly enter on the <laughs> YouTube channel, and I will not read them as I usually do <laughs> and not respond badly to them, but talk among yourselves anyway. <laughs> That's going to wrap it up for this show, this segment, this time. But we'll be back again for more the next time when we're going to talk about time. So yes. we'll do all yeah. that. Uh, good to have you all here. Love you guys. Um, Thanks for coming in.
This is Off Planet Radio, Off Planet TV. The website's still offplanetradio.com. Don't forget about Patreon. Don't forget about it. We have our, our next uh, Patreon group chat coming up in just uh, about uh, just like about 10 days. So get on, join at the $7 or above level, and join us for Alchemical Anarchy in the Patreon chat. Absolutely. Truth is out there. It's inside you. Bye. <laughs> Bye, guys. Bye, guys. Bye, Cliff, thanks so much. Thanks. To, thanks. This is Off Planet Radio.